Shalom, shalom. I need Yehuda Yorah. As you already know, I'm Judah the Shooter. If this is your first time coming to my channel, definitely, definitely like, share, and subscribe. Man, I go over a lot. All right. I do have more than one YouTube channel, but this is the channel. Um, I guess you could say where I've been doing my poly rants, if you will. Uh, and once I'm done with that, as I've always said, I'm going to start doing other lessons and things like that. But um, before we get started, um, once again, like, share, and subscribe. Definitely visit propolybook.com. Of course, you can get the book, The Unwritten Rules of Polygyny, which is actually going all over the world, including Africa, Europe, uh, Asia, you name it. It's literally going all over the world, you know what I'm saying? So definitely propolybook.com. Even if you're a person who are not in support of poly, the book is actually for you as well. It's for men and for women, all right? Now, you can also get poly merchandise as well, such as the flag in the background, the jacket, as you can see, you know what I'm saying? Boom. All right. Got my bit of a Rams theme going, as you see, with the shirt to match, you know? So, yeah, with the shirt to match, of course. And then, you know, I got stuff on the back, you know? I don't know if you're able to see that. All right. Get it from propolybook.com. And, of course, what's the outfit without shoes as well? So, boom. You get the shoes as well. Boom. Hey, hey. 23 on the side, you know what I'm saying? So yeah, I'm gonna put my shoe back on though. All right, but uh, boom. All right, so ladies and gents, what do we have today? So today is a bit of a, a, a video response. All right, so today a brother had tagged me uh, in a post. Now remember, um, oh, one more thing. Um, if you are, if you and I were on each other's friends list in the past, and you may notice that you're no longer on my friends list anymore, or um, in the future, you may know. Just know, relax is not personal. Uh, that page is only for uh, business now. All right, so this is only for people who are, of course, have the merchandise and the book. So it's not for you, whether if I do know you um, personally or if I don't know you. So it's not nothing personal. Oh, he deleted me. He don't mess with me no more. No, don't mean that. It's a business page now. So no matter who you are, if you didn't get the book, you will be removed. In fact, I'm going to remove probably about uh, maybe a good thousand um, sometime this week. You know what I'm saying? Um, including those, oh, I'm going to get it. Nah, all right. Well, then you can come on back after you get it. You know what I'm saying? So um, do not re -add me <laughs> if you haven't gotten it. All right. So now, um, is there anything else I want to say before we get started? Um, yeah, probablybook.com. Once again, get the book. You know what I'm saying? Merchandise and things like that. So with that being said, a brother tagged me in something, and what we're going to do is we're going to go over it, and um, it's a bit of a two-part. So this will be like a two-part video, and at first, um, well, the reason how this video came about, because I was actually about to type and write uh, a response, but then it got long, so I was like, you know what? This probably should just be in a bit of a video form, so I'll also read a little bit what I had wrote, all right? Um then I had noticed and I was noticing I was putting scriptures and I had noticed that, wait, this is going to be too long. So, yeah, I need to go ahead and respond. Um, it's dealing with two sisters in the community. Now, uh, for those of you who understand the written, rule, unwritten rules of polygyny, you know, I kind of talk about certain things within the Hebrew community regarding our sisters. Um, so if you got the book, you already know what I'm talking about. Um, yeah. So let's go ahead and get started. All right. So this right here is the post, all right? And again, uh, it's nothing personal, but this is definitely something that has to be addressed. All right, so um, here we go. So it says new video response to this comment coming, of course. So the first comment um, looks like uh, sister did it two days ago. And she said, there is a whole war going on and y'all still out here trying to collect five more wives and you're living in a duplex or slash apartment uh with the four you have lord the things you see in israel shaking my head two chops to the throat don't come for me then i said here um it says and also a new video response to this comment i mean Another, another sister shared it, all right? 
and this one says polygamy, of course, the ability to disappoint, um, dis to disappoint several women at once. All right. And obviously you see, I put the youtube.com slash Judah the Shooter. Uh, as you see, I went on and concealed the sister's identities because it's nothing personal. Believe it or not, ladies and gents, this is an everyday thing. This is something that we have going on in the nation. There's a huge plague of misinformed sisters and, of course, misinformed brothers. So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and deal with this. And at the end, you are, um, well, maybe right in, I don't know, you even learn a solution, you know what I'm saying, to um, not only how to deal with this, but then also how, brothers, you can put yourself in a better situation as well, if that's something that you definitely desire. All right, so only the discipline will um, will get this, uh, get through the video. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Now that we know that this is not personal or a personal attack on these uh, specific sisters, brothers, as you all know and understand that you have to be careful who you even allow your, uh, your wives to even associate with, um, who even to be around. The reason why I'm saying it is because, believe it or not, the sister actually made the post public for others to be, of course, misinformed. And there is a sister, of course, who shared it, which, of course, I will have to address uh, that as well. So, brothers, look, no one understand that, yo, there's, it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a high rise for misinformation that is being spread. Okay, so now with that being said, um, let's go ahead and deal with this. Let me put this, uh, the screenshot back up. All right, go ahead and take a look at it. And in all fairness, I also want to make a, um, a disclaimer for her just to show you that I'm not being biased, all right, because I'm quite sure the video will get to her, and I would love for that too. you know, someone sending the video, you know, come on in, sis, have a seat, listen and learn, you know what I'm saying, so um, when she made this post, brothers did come for her, of course, even though she said uh, uh, two chops to the throat, you know, boop, boop, <laughs> and she said, don't come for me, laughing. All right, so obviously, you know, she knew heat was gonna come down on this. Now, in all fairness, so it is not biased, I wanna give some of the quotes that she said because brothers did come, you know, come in, you know, letting her have it and pretty much spiritually slammed her. Okay, so she said, one of her comments was, all the brothers is going here, laugh out loud. I never said it was bad, all right? I never said it goes against the Bible. I'm gonna repeat that. She said, I never said it was bad. I never said it goes against the Bible. So brothers, she's not saying it's bad. She's not saying that it goes against the Bible. Now, here's one issue I do have with her because she said, all I said was, it's wartime. We have more important things to worry about. No, you didn't, sis. You did not say that. You said there was a whole war going on. You did not say it's wartime. All right. And uh, you said we have more important things to worry about. Another comment she said, addressing another brother, she said, if you can't handle one, how can you handle two? All right. And I talk about this in my book as well. You know what I'm saying? I actually agree with you on that too, sis. A lot of brothers or, um, or biting on more than they can chew. And um, yeah, so I agree with that. And I talk a lot about this in my book to help the brothers to learn and understand the responsibility behind polygyny, not to be confused with polygamy, all right? So you even used the term wrong and the brother did try to uh, bring correction on that. But anyway, um, another comment she said was, and you have to reread my comment not her post, though, but she said her comment, because I'm simply saying that there is a war going on. So right there, there is a contradiction. See that? Because in the last comment, you said it was wartime. In your post, you said it's uh, a whole war going on. But anyway, you said 
um, why are the men still posting about finding wife number four? Another comment, she said, why are the brothers interpreting this wrong? Well, guess what, sis? I'm not, because I'm reading what you're saying. Another comment is, um, all I'm saying is it's wartime. So there you go. You're saying it again. You said a fourth and a fifth wife is not important right now. That's it. I mean, well, you making this post is not important right now if you want to use that analogy. But anyway, so now that I've given her, uh, given the disclaimers of her arguments, you know, I haven't seen anything else um, during the time, you know, uh, after just video. So if there's something else that said after that, you know, I can't speak on that. I can only speak on what I've seen so far. All right. Now, the first thing we're going to deal with is the term polygamy here. Okay. The word polygamy um sus no one in our community practice polygamy all right we actually practice what you know as polygyny which is what you see on my flag right there polygyny there's a difference between polygamy and polygyny if you get my book the unwritten rules of polygyny i explain the difference but of course i'm not going to sit here and act like i don't know what you're referring to i do know where you're getting at however um, you're using the incorrect term. In fact, I am anti-polygamy. I don't even practice polygamy at all, all right? So with that being said, sis, let me go ahead and share my screen again real quick. You, even though, you know, of course, you may not mean harm, you may have been laughing, it may have been a joke, it may not have been a joke, but what you have to be aware of is that you have to be, you have to take heed on the things that you may say, you know what I'm saying? So keep in mind, another sister shared it. So let's just say she believed the opposite. Let's just say she was anti-poly. Let's just say if she felt like, oh no, it is wrong. It is bad. Now remember, sis, that's opposite of how you feel, right? But there are, there are sisters out there who of course is, misled and misinformed so let's just assume that you're not all right there are your sisters among your peers that's are so that's why of course we have to look at Sirach or ecclesiasticus 1 and 29 which says be not a hypocrite in the sight of men and it says and take good heed of what you speak so take good heed of the things that you say that's the first thing i would tell you sis before we go ahead and uh deal with the post um Take good heed to the things that you say. You know what I'm saying? Uh, take, 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 take good heed. You know, pay attention. You know, because the sister that shared your post and other sisters who may be talking about it, guess what? They may not know and understand them things. You know what I'm saying? And this is one of the reasons why sisters like yourself should be doing the things that my wives are doing. You know, look like things like right here. It says the age women likewise that they be in behavior as becoming holiness. All right, it says not false accusers, not giving too much wine, teachers of good things that they may teach the young women to be sober. Those are the things you should be focused on, sis. Those those things to love the husbands, to love the children. These are some of the things that you should be dealing with with the sisters. What you talking about is not important right now. Why? Because you got a job to do. We're reading it right here. But anyway, it says to be discreet, chaste, that's discipline. Keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husband, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Those are great things to focus on, sis. All right, when you're saying we're at war, okay, or it's wartime. All right, well, sis, since you know that it's wartime, why are you not teaching Titus chapter two? Getting these sisters together, because that's a great plague of monogamous families of wives being disobedient to their husbands. Teach that. Go deal with that and focus on that. Get them sisters together. That's what you can do, sis. Teach that. That's something that's important right now for you to be doing. Biblically speaking, you're a woman of the most high. Of course, I, I'm left to assume that you are. I don't personally know you. All right. So let's go ahead and go back and deal with this. All right. So, you know, we're going to be find ourselves coming here more than once. But again, she said uh, there was a whole war going on a whole war going on 
Well, let's go ahead and deal with that. Well, number one, let me uh, put my Bible back up here. Okay, let's go to Matthew 24 real quick. Matthew chapter 24. And I would like to say, number one, you have the scripture here and verse six written in blood. It says, and you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Here's the part I want right here. Let me highlight this for you guys. Messiah first says, see that you be not troubled. It says, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Right there, look at that. The end is not yet. Then it says, for nation shall rise against nation. Look at that. You got Russia and Ukraine, right? It says, in kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, I go your starvation, and pestilences, right? What is a pestilence? What's that? Let's click on that real quick. What does that mean? All right, uh, well, we had pestilences. Here we go. Boom. Click on it. Oh, well, we yeah. Okay, here we go. A plague, pestilence, right? Pestilence. Got that? So this would be uh, equivalent to like your uh, coronavirus or your Omicron that's killing people, if you will. But then it goes on to say, and earthquakes in diverse or different places. But look at this. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Of the beginning of sorrows. All those things are the beginning of sorrows. Remember he told us, see that you be not troubled. See that you be not troubled. Now, again, it warns us about these things. But as you've seen, it says, see that you be not troubled. See that you be not troubled. The Bible also tells us, real quick, let me go back to my Bible here. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 45, and verse 7. And it says, that's what the Most High says, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace. And create calamity or evil. I, the Lord, do what? All these things. I, the Lord, do all these things. Go to Amos chapter 3. And let's look at the sixth verse. And look at what it says here. Because remember, it says, I, the Lord, do all these things. So if he's behind all of this, why should I be troubled according to the Bible? Sis? Why should I not get married? If the issue is about a number of wives, then maybe men shouldn't be married in the first place then. But let's go to Amos 3 and 6. It says, shall a trumpet be blown in the city and the people be not afraid? Shall there be evil or danger or calamity in the city? And the Lord have not done it? That's a question. We clearly see where the most high is in control of everything. Why should men be afraid of being married? One woman or five women? Why should he be afraid? Second Timothy one, before we get started, verse seven, it says, for the Lord have not given us the spirit of fear. You see that? He didn't give us the spirit of being timid. But what? But of power and of love and of a sound mind. Notice he gives us power and he fills us with what? Love and a sound mind. Sound mind. This is not the time to lose your mind and be afraid. He gives us a sound mind. It's not the time for us, of course, to be timid. Why should we be timid? For what? If wars and rumors of wars is going on, why should we be troubled? Why should we be afraid? The nation of Israel has faced a lot more dangers than that. Talking physical captivity. I mean, right now you can go to the gas station and pump your gas and things like that, you know, but I'm talking physical captivity. 
Let's go to uh, what's that? Jeremiah 29. Let's grab it real quick. Propolybook.com. It's gonna go down. All right. So propolybook.com uh, once again. Now we're at Jeremiah chapter uh 29. We're gonna start in the fourth verse. All right, so it says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Look at this, unto all that are carried away, what? Captives. Mm, this is war. <laughs> You've been taking captives, right? It says, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem unto Babylon. Look at what he told us here. Build ye houses and live in them, dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat the fruit of them. Take ye wives. Look at that. Take ye wives and begat sons and daughters. And take wives for your sons. And give your daughters unto husbands. That they may what? Bear sons and daughters. That ye, that's the key. That ye may be increased there. And not what? Diminish even during the time of captivity. It says, and seek the peace of the city whether I've caused you to be carried away captives. So right here, they were told to even to seek the peace in the city. Go find peace in the place where I've carried away captives and pray unto the Lord for it. For, the, uh, for in the peace thereof shall ye have peace. Wow. That verse is really, really uh, hitting home there, or should hit home. So let's look at that. Again, we're in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 7. He's telling you what about the peace? Wow. And seek the peace of the city. Whether I've caused you to be carried away captives and pray unto the Lord for it. Pray to the Lord for that peace. Mm. For in peace thereof shall ye have peace. Wow. Shall ye have peace. Let's go back to this post still. So. Again, she said there's a war going on. She said it's wartime. Now, a person who I want to deal with is David. I want to deal with David because David, of course, is one of the prime examples of a person that was going through wars. Like, he was actually in wars, and yet he himself, of course, was still taking wives. So we're going to go to, we're going to start at 1 Samuel, the 18th chapter. All right, 1 Samuel, the 18th chapter. Let's go ahead and deal with that. All right, so let's get to it. Remember, propolybook.com. So 1 Samuel, the 18th chapter, starting 17, it says, And Saul said to David, Behold, my elder daughter, Mariab, her will I give thee to wife. All right. Now, remember, Saul was king during this time here. And he's saying, look, I'll give you my elder daughter, Merab. It says, only be thou valiant for me and fight the Lord's battles. For Saul said, let not my own hand be upon him, but let the hand of the Philistines be upon him. And Saul said to David, I'm sorry, and David said to Saul, who am I? And what is my life on my father's family in Israel that I should be son-in-law to the king? So you see right here, you know, he's been humble, like, you know, like me being the king's son-in-law, like, who am I? Like, I ain't nobody important, like, that I should be the king's son-in-law. A king he's talking about, right? So, verse uh, 19, it says, but it came to pass at the time when Mary of Saul's daughter should have been given to David, uh, it says that was she given unto Adriel, the Meholathite, to wife. And Michal, Saul's daughter, loved David. And they told Saul, you see that? And the thing pleased him. All right. 
says a thing please him. All right. Then it goes on to say, and Saul said, I will give him her that she may be a snare, meaning a trap to him. And the hand, yeah, and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Wherefore Saul said to David, thou shalt this day be my son-in-law in the one of the twain, meaning one of the two. And Saul commanded his servant saying, commune with David secretly, like go holler at him in private. And behold, the king have delight in thee, and all his servants love thee. Now, therefore, be the king's son-in-law. And Saul's servants spoke those words in the ears of David. And David said, seem it to, uh, to you a light thing? Like, you think this is a light thing? Y'all taking this lightly, in other words, to be the king's son-in-law, seeing that I'm a poor man, a poor man and lightly esteemed? Keep this in mind. David at this point is a poor man. Poor man. And it said, and lightly esteemed. Hmm. This is going to be very important later. So we see right here, again, this woman loved David. And at this time, David was a poor man. And it said, lightly esteemed, meaning, in other words, like he's insignificant. Like he's nobody important. Nobody in special. Verse 24. And the servants uh, and the servants of Saul told him, saying, on this matter spoke David. So meaning what? They told him what David had said. Verse 25. And Saul said, thus shall you say to David, the king desired not a dowry, meaning a price, but an hundred foreskin of the Philistines to be avenged on the king's enemies. But Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. Keep this in mind. He, of course, was a poor man, lightly esteemed. It's chapter 27, it says, Well, for David arose and went, he and his men and slew the Philistines, 200 men, and David brought their foreskins, and they gave them in full to the king, that he might be the king's son-in-law. And Saul gave him Michal, his daughter, to wife. And Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David, with his poor self, right? And that Michal, Saul's daughter, loved him, even though he was broke. He was broke. Look at that. This is going to be important later. So here it is. He was broke. And as you know, matter of fact, Tell you right here. And Saul was yet more afraid of David. And Saul became David's enemy continually. Became his enemy continually. It says, Then the princes of the Philistines went forth, and it came to pass after they went forth that David behaved himself more wisely than all the servants of Saul, so that the name was much set by. Now, Remember, this is going to be very relevant to the comment the sister saying. It's wartime, or we at war. Um, a whole war is going on, right? Even though the Most High didn't give us the spirit of fear. Now, again, she's not saying that it's bad, and she's not saying that it's against the Bible either. So I have to be fair on that. But there are sisters who are looking at that, and they don't know. So it's mostly for them. Because they don't know. they the ones that's sharing it. That comment and the disclaimer that you put wasn't in the post. All they know for certain is what you put. And if they did know, then they didn't put it on theirs, which means somebody else would see that. So this stuff could spread like a wildfire. And before you know it, you have a lot of ignorance going on in Israel. Now, here we go. We see Saul trying to kill him. Oh, this is definitely war. Because I'm going to address everything that is said in that post, but the things I need to read and get past first so you understand why I'm saying what I'm saying. It'll make sense. So you see, I'm not just talking outside of my neck. Verse one, it says, and Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants that they should kill David. Hmm. Look like war coming to his front door, huh? Oh, yeah. Coming to his front door. They want to kill him, plotting to kill him, right? Of course. 
So let's go ahead and continue. It says, but Jonathan saw son delighted. I have pleasure much in David. And Jonathan told David saying, saw my father seek to kill you. Now, therefore, I pray thee, take heed to yourself until the morning and abide, meaning live or remain in a secret place and hide yourself. Now, you've always heard me uh, uh, talk about this, how David was a poor man. He was on the run and everything like that. This is the chapters that I'm talking about. These are the chapters that I'm talking about. Propolybook.com. Verse three. And it says, I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where thou art. And I will continue with my father of thee. And what I see, that what I tell you. And Jonathan spoke good of David unto Saul, his father. And he said to him, Let the king's sin be against his servant, against David, because he had not sinned against thee. And because his works have been to thee, ward very good. This is what he's telling them. Verse nine, I mean, verse five. For he did put his life in his hand and slew the Philistine and the Lord wrought a great salvation for all Israel. Thou saw this. This is what this is what Jonathan telling his dad. You saw it. You witnessed it. Right. Wartime said and did rejoice. Wherefore then will thou sin against innocent blood to slay David without a cause, many for no reason. And saw so hearken to listen to the voice of Jonathan and saw swear as the Lord liveth. He shall not be slain. Now, we know later that this wasn't all the way true because he himself, of course, was still going to try to go and kill him anyway. Verse 7, it says, And Jonathan called David, and Jonathan showed him all those things, and Jonathan brought David to Saul. Now, remember, Saul was king. Jonathan is the son of Saul. Okay? Saul and David are best friends. But anyway, say it says, uh, and he was in his presence as in the times past. Verse eight, it says, and there was war. Look at that, sis, there go war. Keep this in mind, right? Keep this in mind because remember one of your uh, points is there's a whole war going on and y'all still out here trying to collect more wives. Ooh wee, ooh wee. All right, all right, all right. So, it says, and there was war again, and David went out and fought with the Philistines and slew them with a great slaughter, and they fled from him. And the spirit from the Lord was upon Saul, and he sat in his house with his javelin in his hand. Look at it. I'm sorry. And an evil spirit from the Lord was upon Saul. Now, remember we had learned early in Isaiah 45 and 7? Put that right there. When it said, I formed the light. Right. Right. And how you create darkness, how you create peace and, and evil and things like that. How the Lord do all these things. Yeah. So it says right here. And the evil spirit from the Lord was upon Saul, not from the devil, but. From the Lord, the master, it says, and he sat in his house with his javelin in his hand and David played with his hand. Then it says, and Saul sought to smite David, meaning kill David. It says, even to the wall with the javelin, but he slipped away out of Saul's presence. He got up out of that. <laughs> and he smote the javelin to the wall, and David fled and escaped that night. Verse 11. Saul also sent messages unto David's house. Now, keep this in mind. David at this point in the house now, right? Mm -hmm. Keep that in mind. To watch him. And it says, um, to watch him and slay him in the morning. And Michal, David's wife, told him, saying, if thou save not your life tonight, tomorrow you shall be slain. Like, hey, look, you don't get up out here tonight. Hey, but by tomorrow, you'll be dead. She basically said, look, King, you're going to be a dead man walking, love. <laughs> so Michal let David down through a window, and he went, and he fled, and escaped. And Michal took an image. It says, and laid it in the bed and put a pillow of goats 
hair. This is what me called it, his wife. There's another scripture people take out of context, a whole other topic, though. Uh, for his bosses and covered it with the cloth. So me called it that. Now, remember, he had already escaped. He was gone. So David is not in the bed. It says, uh, and when Saul sent messages to take David, she said, he's sick. Now, remember, he already escaped, got up out of that. And Saul sent messages again to see David, saying, bring him up unto me in the bed that I may slay him. Now, remember, he already gone. And when the messengers will come in, behold, there was an image in the bed with a pillow of goat's hair for his bolster. Now, remember, he wasn't there. He was gone. According to verse 12, he already escaped. But it says, and Saul said unto me, call, why hast thou deceived me and sent away mine enemy that he's escaped? And me call answered Saul. He said unto me, let me go. Why should I kill thee? So David fled and escaped and came to Samuel to Ramah. See that? Came to Samuel to Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. And he, and, and he and Samuel went and dwelt in Naoth. And it said, and it was told Saul saying, behold, David is at Naoth in Ramah. Now remember, he's with who? Samuel. All right, he's with Samuel. Now, again, what I really want you to see here, David is at war. David is on the run. He's on the war, on the run. It said, and Saul sent messages to take David. And when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying and Samuel uh, standing as appointed over them, the spirit of God was upon the messages of Saul. And they also prophesied. And when it was told Saul, he sent other messages and they prophesied likewise. And Saul sent messages again the third time, and he prophesied also. Then went he to Ramah and came to a great well that is in Sehu. And he asked and said, Where are Samuel and, and David? And one said, Behold, they be in the earth in Ramah. Now remember, David is with Samuel out there. And he went thither and they off in Ramah. And the Spirit of God was upon him also. And he went on and prophesied until he came to Naoth in Ramah. And he stripped off his clothes also and prophesied before Samuel in like manner, meaning just like, and lay down naked all the all day, all that day and all that night. What for they say is Saul also among the prophets? Now we're going into chapter 20. Remember, David is on the run, David is obviously homeless, David is at war. War is at his front door. All right. Verse one, it says, I'm going to give you time to get there. About five more seconds. All right, here we go. Verse one, it says, and, uh, and David fled from Naoth in Ramah and came and said before Jonathan, what have I done? What is my iniquity? And what is my sin before your father that seek my life? Like, what did I do so bad that got him wanting to kill me? Huh? Now remember, he's talking to Jonathan, his best friend. All right, verse two. And he said unto him, God forbid thou shalt not die. Behold, my father would do nothing, either great or small, but that he will show it to me. All right? It says, and why should my father hide this thing from me? It is not so. They're letting him know, look, if my dad do anything small or great, he ain't going to keep it from me. All right? So it says, verse three, and David swore moreover and said, your father certainly know that I have found grace or mercy in his eyes. And he said, let not Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. See that? But truly as the Lord liveth, and as my soul liveth, he says, there is but a step between me and death. See that? So here it is, David is on the verge of being killed, dying. He on the run homeless mm. not even a duplex on an apartment or a house to still dwell in mm -mm. yeah war let's continue though verse 4 it says then said Jonathan unto David whatsoever thy soul desireth I will even do it for thee verse 5 it says and David said to Jonathan behold tomorrow is the new moon 
and it should not fail to sit with the king at meat. But let me go that I may hide myself in the field until the third day at even, meaning in the evening, new day. It says, if your father at all miss me, then say, David earnestly asks leave of me that he might run to Bethlehem, his city. Remember, David was born in Bethlehem. All right, I'm, um, uh, he's from the city of Bethlehem. Uh, it says, but there is a yearly sacrifice, sacrifice. There for all the family, verse seven. If he say thus, it is well thy servant shall have peace. But if he be very raw, meaning angry, then be sure that he was determined by him. So you see that they're making a plan to decide. Well, this is how we gonna know if 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 he really trying to kill you, all right? Verse eight it says, therefore shall thou deal kindly with thy servant. For thou hast brought your servant into a covenant of the Lord with thee. Notwithstanding, however, if there be any, uh, if there be, uh, if there be in me iniquity, slay me thyself. For why shouldest thou bring me to your father? Is what he asking. And Jonathan said, Far be from thee. For if I if I knew certainly that evil were determined by my father to come upon you then uh, would not I tell, um, then, um, would I not tell you in other words? Verse 10, then said uh, David to Jonathan, who shall tell me? Or what if my father answered you roughly? You see that? Or what if your father answered you roughly? Blah, 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 blah. Roughly is what he's saying. It says, and Jonathan said to David, come and let us go out into the field. And they, and they went out, both of them, into the field. And Jonathan said unto David, O Lord, God of Israel, when I sounded my father about tomorrow any time or the third day, and behold, if there be good toward David, and I then sin not unto thee, and it show thee. The Lord do so, and much more to Jonathan. But if it please my father to do the evil, I will show it to you and send you away that you may as go as in peace and the Lord be with you as he had been with my father. All right, let's jump down to verse 26 real quick. It says, nevertheless, Saul spoke not anything that day. Because remember, this is the time of the new moon. For he thought something had befallen him. He is not clean. Surely he is not clean. See that? Look at that. They thought he wasn't clean. Hmm, another topic, though. But anyway, and it came to pass on the morrow, which was the second day of the month. It says that David's place was empty. And Saul said unto Jonathan, his son, What forth cometh not the son of Jesse to meet? Neither yesterday nor today. Now, why he ain't come? How come he ain't showed up? And Jonathan answered Saul, David earnestly have leave of me to go to Bethlehem. And he said, let me go, I pray thee, for our family have a sacrifice in the day. And my brother, he have commanded me to be there. And now if I have found favor in thine eyes, let me get away, I pray thee, and see my brethren. Therefore he cometh not unto the king's table. That's why he went in there. That's what, what he told him. All right. Then he says, and Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan. And he said unto him, thou son of a the perverse, rebellious woman. Do not I know that thou hast chosen the son of Jesse to thy own confusion and unto the confusion of your mother's nakedness. For as long as the son of Jesse lived upon the ground, thou shalt not be established, nor thy kingdom. Wherefore now send and fetch him unto me. For he shall surely die. So he's letting them know right there, y'all. And Jonathan answered Saul, his father, and said unto him, What for shall he be slain? What did he do? Like, what are he doing? And Saul cast a javelin, and, a javelin at him to smite him. Whereby Jonathan knew that it was determined of his father to kill or slay David. So Jonathan rose from the table in fear's anger. And did he no meat the second day of the month? But he was grieved 
for David because his father, because his father had done him shame. Verse 35. And it came to pass in the morning that John went out into the field at the time appointed with David and had a little lad with him. A lad is a little boy, all right, a male child. Verse 36. And he said unto his lad, run, find out now the arrows which I shoot. And as the lad ran, he shot an arrow beyond him. And when the lad was to come to the place of the arrow which Jonathan had shot, Jonathan cried after the lad, meaning he spoke out loud and said, is not the arrow beyond you? And Jonathan cried after the lad, make speed, haste, stay not. And Jonathan's lad gathered up the arrows and came to his master. But the lad knew not anything, only Jonathan and David knew the matter because he was telling him in cold when he told him to make speed, haste, don't stay. The little boy obviously would have thought that he was talking to him, but David was listening and David knew and understood, I got to get up out of here. Saul really is finna kill me. That's war when somebody trying to kill you, right? Hmm? So he on the run now. He on the run. Remember, one of the arguments was there was a whole war going on. I still out here trying to collect five more wives. I right? remember I'm address everything that was said. All right. So again, she's not saying it's bad. She's not saying this against the Bible. She's saying there's much more important things to be worried about. All right. That's what she's saying. All right. So I just want to continue that disclaimer. Just want to continue that disclaimer. All right, so let's go ahead and get back to it. Verse 40, it says, And Jonathan gave his artillery unto his lad and said unto him, Go, carry them to the city. 41. And as soon as the lad had gone, number was gone, David arose out of the place toward the south and fell on his face toward the ground and bowed himself three times. And they kissed one another and wept with one another until David exceeded. And Jonathan said to David, go in peace for as much as we have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord saying, the Lord between me and you, between me and between, oh uh, yeah, uh, between me and you and between my seed and your, and your seed forever. And he rose and departed and Jonathan went into the city. Chapter 21. Go ahead and give you about three seconds to get there. All right, let's get it. And remember at this point, David is on the run. He on the run. Uh oh, about to get hungry. Got my juice. All right. It says Then came David to Nob to Ahimelech, the priest. And Ahimelech was afraid at the uh, meeting of David and said unto him, Why art thou alone and no man with thee? Why? And David said to him, elect the priest, the king have commanded me a business, meaning a task. And he said unto me, let no man know anything of the business whereby I send thee. And what I've commanded thee, what I've commanded thee, and I've appointed my servants to such and such place. This is David's response to him, elect the priest. Okay. Verse three. Now, therefore, what is under thy hand? Give me five loaves of bread in my hand, or what there is present. This would be today what you would say, begging for food. Mm -hmm. Verse four. And the priest answered David and said, There is no common bread under my hand, but there is holy, meaning holy bread. That's the show bread, of course, that only the priest could eat. It says that the young men have kept themselves from at uh at least from women because you know leviticus 15 16 to see the copulation while well, you unclean how you gonna be unclean eating hollow bread there you know what i'm saying you saying there's no common bread meaning your uh, everyday bread that uh everybody else could eat you know the common man can eat but anyway it says david answered the priest and said unto him oh of truth women have not been kept from us about these three days since i've came out and the vessels of the young men 
or holy. And the bread is in a manner common. Yeah, though it was sanctified, meaning holy, it says this day in the vessel. See that? Holy bread. So the priest gave him hallowed bread, meaning holy bread. For there was no bread uh, there, but the show bread, as I was just telling you about, that was taken from before the most high to put hot bread in the day when it was taken away. Now, a certain man of the servants of Saul. Now, this is uh, important here because this guy right here eventually going to get people killed because he snitched and told. But anyway, verse 7, it says, Now, a certain man of the servants of Saul were there that day. And he was a servant detained before the Lord. It says, and his name was Doeg, an Edomite, the chiefest of the herdmen that belonged to Saul. And David said to Ahimelech, and, it's not there, uh, and there is not here under thy hand spear or sword? For I have neither brought my sword nor my weapons with me. Because the king's business required haste. He inquired me to be in the hairy on the run. And this is what he told uh, the, um, the priest here, Ahimelech. And the priest said, the sword of um, Goliath, the Philistine, whom thou slewest in the valley of Eleb, behold, it is here, wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If thou will take that, take it. For there was no other save meaning except that here. So nothing else would hear that, that here. And David said, there was none like that. Give it to me. I need that. All right. Verse 10, it says, and David arose and fled that day for fear of Saul. See that? And went to Achish, the king of God. And the servants of Achish said unto him, is not this David king of the land? Did they not sing one to another of him in dances, saying, Saul have slain his thousands and David his ten thousands? And David laid up, his, uh, laid up these words in his heart and was so afraid of Achish, king of God. Now, let's see what happened. Because David was about to look at what he said and change his behavior before him and feign himself mad or like what you call like crazy or a little slow uh, in their hands and scrubbed. I'm sorry, and, scri uh, and, and scrub it on the doors of the gate and let his spittle fall down from his beard. So I'll let you know right then. And now he was acting like, you know, uh, you know, somebody that don't have it all up there. You know what I'm saying? Um, people call it, you know, different names. You know what I'm saying? But anyway, then said Aegis to a service, Lo, you see this man is mad. What for then have you brought him unto me? Have I need of madmen that you have brought this fellow to play the uh to play the mad man in my presence? So this fellow come into my house? That's what he's asking. Chapter 22. Let's get it. So, verse 1, it says, David therefore depart thence and escaped to the cave of Dalam. Hmm. So now David is now in the caves now, huh? At war, on a run. It says, and when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down the, the, to him. Verse two. And everyone that was in distress and everyone that was in debt and everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him, talking about David. And he became a leader or a captain over them. And there was with him about 400 men. Now, keep this in mind. David still ain't got nowhere to live. He ain't got no duplex and no apartment, right? He had war. Now he's the captain, the leader over them. He ain't king yet. Remember, Saul is king. Mm, verse 3. And David went to Mizpah of Moab, and he said unto the king of Moab, Let my father and my mother, I pray thee, come forth and be with you. Look at it said to this Moabite. It says, till I know what God would do for me. So he wanted them to go and live with them. Verse four. 
and he brought them before the king of Moab, and they dwelt with him all the while David was in the hold. Who knows what in the hold means? Hmm? He was in the hold. What that means? That means like uh, he was in the cave. Look at this. Let me see. Um, yeah, uh, here we go. Verse four. This is the good news version. It says, so David left his parents with the king of Moab, and they stayed there as long as David was hiding out in the cave. Look at that. He was in the hole in the cave. It's very important there. All right. So, verse five, it says, and the prophet Gad said to David, abide not in the hole, meaning in the cave. Don't live there. Depart and get thee into the land of Judah. Then David departed and came into what? The forest of Horeb. Now he's living in the forest. On the run. Remember, he's still at war. Keep this in mind. It's going to be very relevant to what the sister's bringing out. All right. I want to use him as an example. All right. So when Saul heard that David was discovered and the men that were with him, now Saul abode in Gebeah under a tree in Ramah, having his spear in his hand and all his servants were standing about him. And Saul said unto his servants that stood by him, Hear now, ye Benjamites, will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards? Like, you mean y'all think that's what he gonna be doing? Huh? And make you all captains of thousands and captains of hundreds? That all of you have conspired against me and there's none that showed me that my son have made a league with the son of Jesse? And there was none of you that is sorry for me or showing to me that my son have stared up my servant against me and lying and wait at this day? Then answered Doag the Edomite. And remember, this is the uh, Himalek's, the priest's servant. I mean, uh, uh, he was the one that was with Himalek the priest. And he was the one that was a, uh, Saul's servant. My bad. Verse 9, it says, Then answered Doag the Edomite, which was set over the servants of Saul, and said, <laughs> yeah, I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nob to Ahimelech, the son of Ethu. See that? Uh, Ahitu. I saw him. He's snitching. That's all. It says, and he inquired of the Lord for him and gave him victuals. They even gave him food too. And gave him the sword of Goliath, the Philistine. Remember, we just read that in chapter 21. Now he's telling. Now remember, David on the run, he was hungry, he was homeless, he broke, he had war, right? Verse 11. Now remember, we read in 1 Samuel 18, 23, he was a poor man, right? Remember, uh, was it, yeah, 1 Samuel 18 and 23? Yeah, he was a poor man, right? Verse 23. Let's go back to chapter 22 now. All right. Verse 11. Then the king sent to call Ahimelech the priest, the son of Ahito, and all his father's house, the priests that were in Nob. And they came, all of them, to the king. And Saul said, Hear now, thou son of Ahito. And he answered, Here I am, my lord. And Saul said unto him, Why have you conspired against me? Thou and the son of Jesse, in that I was giving him bread and a sword, and I've inquired of God for him, that he should rise against me to lie in wait as this day. As at this day, why you do that? He's confronting him about this. Now let's see what Ahimelech the priest's reply is. And Ahimelech answered the king and said, And who is so faithful among all your servants as David, which is the king's son-in-law? And goeth at any bidding and honorable in thy house. That's what he asked him. Did I then begin to inquire in God for him? Be it far from me. Let not the king impute anything unto his servant, nor to all the house of my father. For thy servant knew nothing of all of this, less or more. Like I knew nothing less and nothing more. Nothing more, nothing less, let me say. Verse 16. And the king said, Thou shalt surely die, Ahimelech, thou and all thy father's house. Man, this is how you know Saul is angry. 
I'm finna kill you and I'm finna kill everybody in your father's house or family. And the king said unto the footman and stood by him, turn and slay the priests of the Lord because their hand is also with David. And because they knew when he fled and did not show it to me. Y'all knew he ran, y'all ain't tell me. Y'all ain't show me, you ain't tell me where he went. I, all right, all y'all gotta die. What he's saying. But the servants of the king would not put forth their hand to fall upon the priests of the Lord. Oh no, oh no. See, the miserable was like, nah, you can't do that one. We're going to do what you're going to do with you. Uh -uh, I ain't doing it. But it's old Edomite. Esau. <laughs> so it says, and the king said to Doag, turn thou and fall upon the priest. And Doag the Edomite turned and he fell upon the priest and slew on that day four score and five persons. Now one score is 20. It said four, 20, 40, 60, 80. And then it said five, so 85. Persons that did wear a linen ephod. Verse 19, it says, And Nob, the city of the priests, smote he with the ears of the sword, both men and women, children and sucklings, and oxen and asses and sheep with the ears of the sword. And one of the sons of Ahimelech, the sons of Ahitub, named Abathar, escaped and fled after David. And Abathar showed David that Saul had slain the Lord's priests. Wow. And David said unto uh, Abiathar, I knew it that day when Doeg the Edomite was there. Like I knew it that he would surely tell Saul. I knew he was going to snitch. I knew he was going to be the one to tell. That's what he said. He says, I've occasioned the death of all the persons of thy father's house. Abide with me. Stay with me. Fear not. Don't be afraid. For he that seeketh my life seeketh your life. I mean, the one that's trying to kill me he going to come after you too. Says, be with me and thou shalt be in safeguard. Chapter 23. All right. Chapter 23. Let's get it. Says, then they told David saying, behold, the Philistines fight against um, uh, Kilia and they rob the threshing floors. And David inquired of the Lord saying, shall I go up and smite these Philistines? And the Lord said unto David, go and smite the Philistines and save Kila. And David's men said unto him, behold, we are afraid here in Judah. How much more then if we come to uh, Ki uh, Kila, uh, 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 Kila against the armies of the Philistines? Then David inquired of the Lord yet again. And the Lord answered him and said, Arise and go down to Caleb, for I would deliver the Philistines into thine hand. So David and his men went to Caleb and brought forth the Philistines and brought away their cattle and smote them with a great slaughter. So David saved the inhabitants of Caleb. Verse 6. And it came to pass when Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech, fled to David to Caleb that he came down with an ephod in his hand. And it was told that Saul was to come to Kyla. And Saul said, God have delivered him into my hand, for he is shut in by entering into a town that have gates and bars. So now he's saying you're right there. Oh, okay, I heard that he's down there in Kyla. You know what? God has delivered David into my hands. He's he, he gonna be trapped. This city got uh, gates and bars. Let's go down there and trap him in, in other words. So now he's thinking that this is my chance. I can go and get him right now. Propolybook.com. Get the book, The Unwritten Rules of Polygyny. All right. Then it goes on to say in verse 8, And Saul called the people together, together to war. Look at that, sis. I go to that war. I'm getting somewhere with this. There's long wars going on, but something happened. It's very relevant to the post that you put out. All right. But anyway, and again, I know, I, and I know you said this, you ain't saying that it's bad. You're not saying it's against the Bible either. But everybody don't know that. All right. Everybody don't know that. So 
I got to set the record straight. But anyway, verse 8, and Saul called all the people to war to go down to Caleb to beseech David and his men. And David knew that Saul secretly practiced mischief or evil against him. And he said unto Abiathar, the priest, bring hither the ephod. Then said David, O Lord God of Israel, thy servant has certainly heard that Saul seeketh to come to Caleb to destroy the city for my sake. Verse 11, will the men of Caleb deliver up unto his hand? Will Saul come down? And as thy servant have heard, O Lord God of Israel, I beseech thee, tell him your servant. And the Lord said, he will come down. Then said David, will the men of uh, Caleb deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, they will give you up or deliver you up. So he told him, so he knew what was going to happen. Verse 13, then David and his men, which were about 600, arose and departed out of Caleb and went with us, uh, whithersoever they could go. So they went wherever they can go. And it was told Saul that David was escaped from Caleb. And he forbade to go forth. And David abode or lived in the wilderness in strongholds. Just look at that. And remained in a mountain in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul sought him every day. But God delivered him not in his hand. Now, look at that. Look where he was at. Let's look at that GMB. Good news verse. Look at this. It says, where are we at? And David stayed hiding in the hill country in the wilderness of Ziph. Look at that. Look at that. David was homeless, living in the wilderness, living in caves at war, on the run. Obviously, his situation is way more serious than you got this type of situation, which would be like us today. Surely, his situation was way more serious. It was at his front door. He on the run right now. He already got one wife right now, Miko. He already poor. Surely, his situation is worse. Man. Woo. All right. Verse 15 says, and David saw that Saul was come out to seek his life. And David was in the wilderness of Ziph in the woods. Look at that. Living in the woods, bro. Mm. Verse 16, living in the woods now. Yeah, war on the run. Saul trying to seek his life. Got his people looking for him, right? And he said unto him, fear not, for the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find thee. And thou shalt be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. And that also Saul, my father, knoweth. Verse 18. And they too made a covenant, meaning agreement before the Lord. And David abode in the woods. Look at that. He lived in the woods. And Jonathan went to what? His house. David ain't have a house. He ain't have a duplex. Sis. He ain't had no apartment. He ain't had no house. He ain't had no dwelling place to live. Keep this in mind. Verse 19. Then came up Ziphites to Saul to Gibeah, saying, Do not David hide himself with us in the strongholds in the woods in the hill of Hachilah, which is on the south of uh, Jeshimon? Now, therefore, O king, come down according to all thy desire of thy soul to come down and our part shall be to deliver him into the king's hand. And Saul said, blessed be ye of the Lord for you have compassion on me. Go, I pray thee, prepare yet and know and see his place where his hunt is and who have seen him there. For it is told me that he dealt very subtle, subtly. See, therefore, and take knowledge of all the lurking places where he hide himself. And come ye again to me with the certainty, and I will go with you. And it shall come to pass, if he be in the land, that I will search him out through all the thousands of Judah. I'm going to find him. And they arose and went to Ziph before Saul. But David and his men were in the wilderness of my own. So you see that they on the move. <laughs> and the plain of Jesse mine. 
They on the move, as you see. And Saul also and his men went to seek him. And they told David, wherefore he came down into a rock and abode in the wilderness my own. See where he living at in the wilderness. And when Saul heard that, he pursued after David in the wilderness of Maon. And Saul went on his side. Saul went on his side of the mountain. And David and his men on that side of the mountain. And David made haste, I meaning he hurried up to get away for fear of Saul. For Saul and his men have compassed and surrounded David and his men round about to take them. But there came a message unto Saul, hasty and come, for the Philistines have invaded the land. So right before they was going to get at them, boom, he just got word, hey, they over the, uh, they back at home, uh, basically um, uh, invading the land. You got intruders. So obviously, you know, Saul got to get up out of there now. Because why? Because what's more important for him to go out to David or the land that's being invaded? Dang, I got to go. Got to grow. I'm going to see. I'm going to catch you later. You know, if we were uh, doing dramatizing. <laughs> Verse 28. Wolf well, Saul returned from pursuing uh, after David and went against the Philistines. It says, therefore, they called that place Selah Mechalo. And David went up from thence and dwelt in the strongholds of En Gedi. Look at this. Look at where he's living, y'all. On the wrong poor. Mm, mm, mm. Chapter 24. And it came to pass when Saul was returned from following the Philistines. Look at that. Just got done. Then it was told him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of Engedi. Huh. And Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of Israel, out of all Israel, and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks. Of the wild goats. Hmm. Look at that. And he came to the sheep coats, by the way, where there was, I mean, where was a cave. And Saul went over to cover his feet, and David and his men remained in the size of the cave. Look at that, y'all. Look at that. Verse 4 says, and the men of David said to him, Behold, in the, uh, the day of which the Lord said to thee, Behold, I will deliver thy enemy into thy hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem unto thee. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privily. Meaning what? Secretly. He didn't know. It wasn't known. Verse 5. And it came to pass afterwards that David's heart smote him because he cut off Saul's skirt. And he said unto his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch forth my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. So you see right here, even though he was trying to kill David, David was still righteous. And they're like, you know what? He's still the Lord's anointed. I feel bad and guilty for even doing that. No. So he still understood that that was the Lord's anointing. Verse seven. So David stayed and his servants with these words and suffered them not or allow them to not to rise against Saul. But Saul rose up out of the cave and went on his way. And David arose after and went out of the cave and cried out to Saul saying, my Lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind at him, David stooped with his face toward the earth. And bowed himself. And David said to Saul, What forth hear thou men's words, saying, Behold, David seeketh thy hurt. Behold, this day thy eyes have seen how that the Lord have delivered thee today into my hand in the cave. And some bade me kill thee, like some people told me to kill you. But my eyes spared thee, and I said, I will not put forth my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Moreover, my father see, yeah, see the, see the skirt of your robe in my hand. For in that, I cut off the skirt of your robe and killed you not. Know, the, know thou 
and see that there is neither evil nor transgression in my hand. And I have not sinned against thee, yet thou huntest my soul to take it. The Lord judged between me and you, and the Lord avenged me out of you. But my hand shall not be upon thee. As the Proverbs of the ancients, wickedness proceeded from the wicked, but my hand shall not be upon thee. After whom is the king of Israel come out? After whom dost thou pursue? After a dead dog, after a flea. The Lord therefore be judge and judge between me and you and see and plead my cause and deliver me out of your hand. And it came to pass when David had end of speaking these words unto Saul, that Saul said, is it your voice, my son, David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. And he said to David, thou art more righteous than I, for thou hast rewarded me good, whereas I have rewarded you evil. And thou hast showed this day how that thou hast dealt with me. For as much as the Lord hath delivered me into your hand, thou killest me not. For if a man find his enemy, will he let him go away? What for the Lord reward thee good for that thou hast done unto me this day? And now behold, I know well that thou shall surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. Swear now therefore unto me by the Lord that you would not cut off my seed after me and that I would not destroy my name out of my father's house. And David swore unto Saul and Saul went home. But David and his men got them up into the hole. Like still went on into that cave though, right? See that? Saul went home. David and his people, they went to the hole. Chapter 25. Now again, we see in here, David, the house of David, the house of Saul is at war. It's wartime. He on the run. Now, of course, if you know the Bible, you know that that was a lie. Saul wasn't done with David. At that moment, yeah, but he wasn't done. Wasn't done. Now, here it is. They're on the run. Right now, we're finna read about the part where Samuel had died. All right, let's go ahead and get it. And Samuel died, and all the Israelites were gathered together and lamented him, meaning they were mourning, and buried him in his house at Ramam. And David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. And there was a man in my own whose possessions were in Carmel, which is a city. It's funny because me and my wife was just talking about this the other day. That video will be up on our YouTube channel. Uh, it says, and the man was very great. See what kind of man he was, y'all? Very great. And had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. Look at that. And he was shearing his sheep in what? The city of Carmel. And that was a, uh, now the, the name of the man was Nabal. Now, obviously, well, yeah, I don't know yet, but let's look at that real quick. Nabal. His name means what? Fool. Nabal or Nabal. Fool, that's what his name means. Fool, foolish. So anyway, it said, now the name of the man was Nabal and the name of his wife, Abigail. And she was a woman of good understanding and of a beautiful countenance. But the man was churlish and evil in his doings. And he was of the house of Caleb. Now churlish means what? That means that he's cruel, he's heavy, he's a burdensome. He's hard to deal with, can't tell him nothing. That man was churlish. Matter of fact, look, let's look at that real quick. And the man was churlish. There we go. He's stubborn. Yeah. Cruel. Grievous. Obstinate. Stubborn. Look at that. Can't tell him nothing. That's the type of man he was. But his woman wasn't like that. She was a woman of good understanding. Verse 4. And David heard in the wilderness that Nabal did shear sheep. And David sent out 10 young men 
And David said unto the young men, get ye up to Carmel and go to Nabal and greet him in my name. And thus shall you say to him that liveth in prosperity, tell him Nabal, peace be both to you and peace be to your house and peace be unto all that you have. Because remember, he was very great as we learn in this verse. He had 3,000 sheep and a thousand goats. That's why David's saying that. That's why he's saying that at this point. All right. So here we go. Verse seven. And now I've heard that thou hast, she uh, thou hast shearers. Now your shepherds, which were with us, we didn't hurt them. We hurt them not. Neither was there art missing unto them. Like I ain't had nothing missing either. Like we didn't take nothing from them. It says, all while they was in Carmel. Ask your young men. They'll show you. Well, for let the young men find favor in your eyes. For we come in a good day. Give. Give, I pray thee. Whatsoever come to thy hand unto your servants and to your son David. Now, remember, David was on the run from Saul. Samuel just died. Hard time. This is war. Hey, war. Somebody trying to kill him still. They asking to be fed. Today, you call him a hobo, broke, homeless. Huh? Feed us. Let's see how this turn out. It says, um, oh, we had it. Uh, come to this one. Yep, here we go. And, and when David's young men came, they spake to Nabal according to all those words in the name of David and see. So they told him and they stopped. Now they're waiting for his answer. And Nabal's answer, David's servant, and said, who is David? And who is the son of Jesse? There be many servants nowadays that break away every man from his master. Now, according to Deuteronomy chapter uh, 23 and verse uh, 15, it says, you shall not deliver unto his master the servant which is escaped from his master unto thee. So that's what he was talking about. You know what I'm saying? We had a law to where if one of them, if a servant escaped from their boss or their owner, you know what I'm saying? Then we had a law on that. But it says about the servant, he shall live with you among you in the place where you should choose in one of your gates. Where like is them best. So obviously he's going to go where it made him feel safe. Thou shall not oppress him. But look at what Nabal is doing. The opposite, oppressing them. He ain't let them. If you if you thought that that's what it was, you should have been like, okay, come live with me then. And one of your gays were like, in the the ball could have did that because he's very great. He could have did that. You know what I'm saying? But he didn't want to do that either. All right. So now, with that being said, let's go back to First Samuel, chapter twenty-five, and I'm in tenth verse. All right. And the ball answered, David's servant said, "Who is David?" Now, who's the son of Jesse? There'd be many servants nowadays that break away every man from his master. Okay, well, if you felt like that, then you should have took him in then. We had a law on that. But it says, shall I then take my bread and my water and my flesh, meat, <laughs> that I have killed for my shearers and given unto men whom I knew not what they be? I don't know where they come from. I don't know them. Should I take the stuff that I work hard for and give it to them? I don't know them. Wow. So it says, so uh, so David's young men turned their way, went again, and came and told David all these things. The ball said, shall I take my bread, my water, my flesh, and I've killed for shivers and give it to men whom I know not once they be? So that's what they went back and told him. And David said unto his men, gird you up every man his sword. And they gird on every man his sword. And David also girded with his sword. And there went up after David. See that? And about 400 men and 200 abode by the stuff. So you see that? They stayed by the stuff. But one of the young men told Abigail and the boss wife, saying, behold, David sent messages of, uh, out of the wilderness to salute our master. This is what one of them saying to Abigail. And he railed on them. He went smooth off on them. Yo. Abigail, like, what you going to do? Like, man, we going to die. David ain't playing. He didn't want to feed him. Oh, no. But anyway, it says, but the, uh, but the men were very good unto us. Because you remember David told 
do that. It says, and we were not hurt, neither missing we anything as long as we were uh, conversant with them when we were in the fields. It says, it says, uh, they were a wall unto us both by night and day. So you see, they obviously was protecting them. All the while we were with them, keeping the sheep. Now, therefore, now, and consider, what will you do? That's what the servant said to the wife. For evil is determined against our master and against, uh, all, uh, against all his household. For he is such a son of Belial that a man cannot speak to him. I remember, according to verse three, he was churlish, right? You saw what that meant. He was cruel, stubborn, a burdensome, heavy, couldn't tell him nothing. Nabal meant fool. Name speaks for itself as you read this chapter. But look, let's jump on down because something that happened to Nabal though. All right. I'm going to start and um, uh, let's see. I'm going to start here in verse 35. It says, so David received of her hand that she had brought him and said unto her, go in peace, thy house. I'm going to go in peace of thy house. See, I have hearkened to your voice and have accepted thy person because she ended up feeding them. All right. So it says, and Abigail came to Nabal and behold, he held a feast in his house, like the feast of a king. So he ended up kicking it like he is straight up king. Now we know Saul was king at the time, obviously. Says, and the ball's heart or his mind was merry with him. So he was cheerful right now. Says, but he was very drunk, a drunken. What for she told him nothing less than more into the morning light. So obviously she, you know, she let her just linger on to the morning. I ain't going to tell him, look, he, he drunk and that kicking and all of that. Now nah, I'm going to just wait till the morning to tell him, Nero, all of us was going to die because you Wanted to be churlish. Remember, she was a woman with a good understanding. But anyway, verse 37, it says, but it came to pass in the morning while the wine was gone out of the bar, meaning out of his system. It says, and his wife had told him these things that his heart died within him and it became as a stone. Like, what? Are you serious? Like, they was going to come kill us? And then he could have got him too because he was drunk. He was in there kicking it. It was off guard. He could have hit him that night. He could have took it to him. Verse 38. And it came to pass, look at this, guys, about 10 days after. Let me highlight that real quick. How many days went by, y'all? 10 days. And today, that ain't even two weeks. And remember, he was homeless, on the run, broke, asked another man to feed him, couldn't feed himself, and the people that was fighting for David, right, couldn't feed them either. They wasn't servers in the sense of like uh, working for him for wages. They were people who were fighting for David. If you paid attention in chapter 22, he became their leader. All right? So it wasn't like this was like a master servant type of situation. These were people that loved David, were fond of David. But anyway, verse 38, it's going to go down. And it came to pass about 10 days after that the Lord had smote the ball that he died. And when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, blessed be the Lord that have pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal and have kept his servant from evil. Because remember, David was finna what? Go and kill him. But the Most High had intervened in that and didn't allow that to happen. He didn't allow it to happen. So it goes on to say, um, for the Lord have returned the wickedness of Nabal upon his own head. And David sent and communed with Abigail. What? To do what, y'all? to look at this right here, to take her to him to wife. Now you would think that David who's at war right now would have more important things to be worried about. You would think that, right? Now remember, there's a whole war going on and y'all still out here trying to collect five more wives. So David is at war, somebody's trying to kill him. He's on the run, couldn't even feed himself. He broke, is what you'd say. He was a hobo, bro. You would think he had more important things to worry about since he can't feed himself. Just 10 days ago, you were begging for food. And you was about to kill a man because he wouldn't even feed your hungry self. You would think that he has more important things to be worried about, right? Sure. Sure he does. 
Now, these brothers today who the sister may be referring to can obviously go feed themselves. You know, some of them got cell phones that can be online. So surely they wouldn't be worse off than, than what David was living in the wilderness, homeless and broke, living in caves. Huh? Hmm. And that's something. Now he's already married to me, Carl. Now you want another wife, David? You want Polly? And you homeless and broken on the run? Shame on you, David, huh? <laughs> Look at this. To take her to him to wife. And when the servants of David would come to Abigail to Carmel, they spake unto her saying, David sent us to you. Look at this. This is what they told her. They would have told her to take you to him to wife. Let's see. She was like, Negro, please. You couldn't even feed yourself. Ain't you married to another woman already? Don't you got more important stuff to be worried about? Ain't, ain't, ain't you at war? The house of Saul, the house of David? Got your men with you? Like, shouldn't you be worried about more important things? Let's look at this. And she arose and bowed herself on the face, on, I mean, on her face to the earth and said, behold, look at what she said to them. Let your hand may be a servant to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord. Look, she called David her Lord, her master. What does that mean? Let's click on that real quick. A dome. Look at this. A dome to rule sovereign. That is what? That's her controller, her Lord, her master, her owner. Jeez. That's what she said. That's what she called David with his baroque behind that couldn't even feed itself just 10 days ago and was about to go kill a man because he couldn't feed himself. He got nowhere to live, already got a wife, should be worrying about more important things. It's wartime. I'm, I'm not done. I'm not done. There's plenty of situations that we can see today that are even worse in the Bible. But check it. He trying to, he worried about a wife. You should be worried about feeding yourself, right, David? You should be worried about being stable, right? Mm. Let's deal with this. So, <clears throat> and Abigail hastened and arose and rode upon an ass with five damsels. That's women. Na'er in Hebrew. Let's look at that. Na'er. Damsels. Na'er. A girl. See that? Got a young woman with her. Homegirls. What we say today. Of hers that went after her, meaning that they were following her. You know how when cars is driving down the street, they trailing each other? That's what they were doing right here. It says, and she went after the messages of David. So now everybody's trailing one another. The messages of David, Abigail, and then her five homegirls trailing. They all trailing. They headed to David. But anyway, it says, and became his wife. So now it says, and David also took who? A henom of Jezreel. And they what? Were also both them his wives. Now, wait a minute. David and took another wife. He's already married to Michal. Now, I know we see that last verse. When it says, um, but Saul had given Michal, Saul's daughter, David's wife, to Fauci, the son of Laish, which was of Gilliam. And I'm going to speak about that surely in a second. But notice, here it is that David was homeless, broke, at war, on the run, living in caves, living in, living in worse conditions, couldn't feed itself. But yeah, now he got three wives now. He collecting wives, isn't he? Now, one may say, no, it says right there that Mekar, his first wife, was given away. But guess what he did? I'm going to just hit that real quick. Second Samuel 3 and 14. And David sent message to Esbosheth, Saul's son, saying, deliver me my wife Mekar, which I espouse or engage or betrothed to me for 104 skin of the Philistines. And each was sent and took her from her husband, even from Fauci, the son of Laish. And her husband went, went with her along, weeping 
behind her to bury him. And they said, Abner to him, go and return. And he returned, got up out of that. So he went and got her back. Let's, let's understand that. All right. So technically, um, he got Mikal, he got Abigail, and now he got a he a he which is her friend. One, obviously, one of the five downs was the homegirls that went with her. But yeah, he's still at war. He's still on the run, still homeless. Mm. And that's something. He collecting wives, isn't he? Hmm. Chapter 26. Remember, Saul said he wasn't going to kill him, wasn't going to come out him no more. He lied. Yeah, here we go. He lied. He lied. Spoiler alert. So it says, and the Ziphites came unto Saul to Gebiah, saying, do not, I'm, I'm saying, do if not David hide himself in the hill of Hekela, which is before Jesse Mon? Let he go, running his mouth. And Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph, having 3,000 men of Israel with him to seek David in the wilderness of Ziph. Now, remember, he got three wives. Two of them are with him right now. You know what I'm saying? So the his first wife, we learn later, you know, in 2nd Samuel, third chapter, he went back and got her. You know what I'm saying? But those are still his three wives. So anyway, it says in verse 4, David therefore sent out spies and understood that Saul was come in very deed. And look at this, guys. <laughs> Man, it says, and David arose and came to the place where Saul had pitched. And David beheld the place where Saul lay. And Abner, the son of Ner, the captain of his host, and Saul lay in the trench. And the people pitched round the bottom. All right, round the bottom. Verse 6, then answered David and said to Ahimelech the Hittite. Uh, it says, and to Abshai, the son of Zeruah, brother to Joab, or Joab, saying, who will go down with me to Saul to the camp? And Abishai said, I will go down with you. <laughs> I'm down. Let's do it. So David and Abishai came to the people by night. Behold, Saul lay sleeping within the trench, and his spear stuck in the ground at his bolster. But Abner and the people lay round the bottom. Then Abishai said to David, God have delivered your enemy into your hand this day. Now, therefore, let me smite him. I pray thee with the spear, even to the earth at once. And I will not smite him the second time. Man. And David said to Abishai, destroy him not. For who can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? He's still being righteous. Hmm. David said, furthermore, as the Lord liveth, the Lord shall smite him, or his day shall come to die, or he shall descend into battle and perish. Mm. The Lord forbid that I should stretch forth my hand against the Lord's anointed, but I pray thee, take thou now the spear that is at his bolster, like take it, and the crows of water, and let us go. So he like, look, man, look. Even though we can catch him, what you call lacking, we ain't going to do that. You know what I'm saying? Baby, look, go take his spirit and go take his crust, uh, crust of water and let's get up out of here. Right? He could have killed him that day, but he didn't want to touch the Lord's anointed. Now, remember, David at this point was also the anointed too. He was what you call like anointed king, but he wasn't actually a king yet. All right? So he himself is anointed. But he didn't want to touch him, though. So here we go. It says, verse 12, it says, So David took the spear and the crows of water from Saul's bolster. And it says, and they got them away, and no man saw it, nor knew it. Ain't nobody see them, y'all. Neither awaken, for they were all asleep. Because what? Because a deep sleep from the Lord was befallen upon them. He most high had them knocked out. <laughs> man it says then david <laughs> went over to the other side and stood at the top of an hill afar off afar off a great space between them and david cried to the people and to abner the son of Ner, saying 
answer thou not Abner. Then, answered, uh, then Abner answered and said, who art thou that criest to the king? Then David said to Absalom, I'm Abner, art not thou a valiant man? And who is like thee in Israel? Wherefore then hast thou not kept your Lord the king? Like meaning kept him like you weren't watching him. For there come one of the people to destroy the king, your Lord. Like, why you wasn't watching them, buddy? You sleeping. You supposed to be a valley, man. Ain't nobody like you in Israel. How we get his stuff? If you so big and bad, <laughs> in other words. But anyway, verse uh, 16, it says, this thing is not good that, uh, that thou hast done. As the Lord liveth, you are worthy to die because you have not, you have not kept your master. Mm, mm, mm. The Lord's anointed. And now see where the king's spear is and the crust of water that was at his bolster. Like, yeah, we got that. <laughs> and Saul knew David's voice and said, is that voice my son, David? And David said, it is my voice, my Lord, O king. And he said, what forth do my Lord thus pursueth after his servant? What have I done? Or what evil was in my hand? Now, therefore, I pray thee, let my Lord, the king, hear these words of his servant. If the Lord have stirred thee up against me, let him accept an offering. But if they be children of men, cursed be they before the Lord. For they have driven me out this day from abiding in inheritance of the Lord, saying, go serve other gods. Mm, mm, mm. Now, therefore, let not my blood fall to the earth before the face of the Lord. For the king of Israel is to come out to seek a flea as when doeth a hunt of partridge in the mountains. Then said Saul, I have sinned. Return, my son, for I would no more do thee harm because my soul was precious in thine eyes this day. Behold, I have played the fool and if Ur erred exceedingly, and David answered and said, Behold, the king's spear, and let one of the young men come over and fetch it. The Lord render to every man his righteousness and his faithfulness, for the Lord delivered thee into my hand today. But I will not stretch forth my hand against the Lord's anointed. And behold, as thy life was much to set by this day in my eyes, so let the life be as much set be in the eyes of the Lord and let him deliver me out of the hand of tribulation. See there, y'all? Then Saul said to David, blessed be thou, my son, David. Thou shall both do great things and also shall still prevail. So David went on his way and Saul returned to his place. So you see that? They still on the move. Still on the move. See chapter 27. It says, and David said in his heart, I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. This is what he's saying in his mind. There was nothing better for me that I should speedily escape into the land of the Philistines. So that's what he's saying right there. Because he think like, man, dude gonna mess around and end up killing me. I need to just go into the hand of the Philistines. The same Philistines and he didn't went after. All right. So, and Saul shall despair of me to seek me any more in any coast of Israel. So I shall escape out of his hand. So you see, he's still on the run. See that? First Samuel 27 and two. Remember, visit propolybook.com to get the unwritten rules of polygyny. Mm. Verse two, and David arose and he passed over with the 600 men that were with him unto Achish, the son of May uh, Mayak. King of God. And David dwelt with Akash at God, he and his men, every man with his household. Even David, look at this, with his two wives living together. Didn't have an apartment, didn't have a duplex. His two wives living with him. He's still on a run, still in fear of his life. Hmm? So it says Ahinom, the Jezreelist. 
and Abigail the Carmelite. Nabal's wife. Remember, Nabal was the one that died, right? And he had Abigail. Now, look at that. Look at that. They living with somebody else. Dang, David, come on now. What would somebody say about that today? Sheesh. You sitting there, uh, you sitting there, you and uh, uh, your men and your two wives in somebody else's household? Jeez, on the run. So it says, and it was told Saul that David was fled to God, and he saw no more again for him. And David said to Achish, if I've now found grace in your eyes, let them give me a place. Look at this. When we call it today, begging today, and some town in the country that I may dwell there. For why should your servant dwell in the royal city with you? Mm. And Achis gave him Ziglag that day. Well, for Ziglag pertaineth unto the kings of Judah unto this day. And at the time David dwelt in the country of the Philistines was a full year and four months. All right. Check this out. But, oh, boy, you better believe it's not over, even though he was there four years and four months. And David and his men went up and evaded the um, Geshurites and the Gezerites and the Amalekites. For those nations were of old and the inhabitants of the land. And thou goest to Shur, even unto the land of Misraim and Egypt. And David smote the land and left neither man nor woman alive and took away the sheep and the oxen and the asses and the camels and the pair and returned to Achis. And Achis said, whether have ye made a road today? And David said, against the south of Judah and against the south of the Jamerites and against the south of the Kenites. And David saved neither man nor woman alive to bring tidings or news to God saying, lest they should tell on us a snitch saying, so did David and so will be his manner all while, all the while he dwelt in the country of the Philistines. And Achis believed David saying, he have made his people Israel utterly to abhor him. That's what he said. Therefore he shall be my servant forever. That's what he said. Chapter 28, man. So understand what's going on here. He at war, people trying to kill him, trying to kill him. Matter of fact, now this is dealing with uh, Saul when he went to go seek out the, uh, Samuel, because um, remember he had died or whatnot. Um, so um, now we won't deal with that because um, that's actually irrelevant. So we'll jump to chapter 30, the 30? Yeah, chapter 30, David's wives. Hmm. Let's go ahead and deal with that. It says, and it came to pass when David and his men came to Ziglag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziglag had smitten Ziglag and burned it with fire and had, look at verse two, and had taken the women captives that were therein and they slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city and behold, it was burned with fire. Jeez. And their wives and the sons and the daughters were taken captives. I go war. Mm. Then David and his people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. They had no more strength to keep crying. Man. Verse five. And David's two wives were taken captives. A he the Jezreelist and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, Nabal, the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed for the people spake of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved in every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord as God. Man, they was ready to stone David. It's your fault. <laughs> and David said to Ahibathar, the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Ahibathar and uh, Abiathar brought the, the, the ephod to David. And David inquired as the Lord saying, shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, pursue. For thou shalt surely overtake them 
and without fail, recover all. So David went and the 600 men that were with him and they came to the brook Besor with those that were left behind stayed. But David pursued he and the 400 men for 200 of old behind, like they stayed behind, which was so faint that they could not go over to a brook to the brook the soil. So that they were so weak, they were so distraught. 200 was like, man, I ain't even going. I can't even go. I ain't got the strength. And he found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David and gave him bread. And he did eat. And they made him drink water. And they gave him pieces of cakes of figs and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, his spirit came again to him. So he had some strength there, huh? For he had eaten no bread nor drunk any water these three days and three nights. And David said to him, to whom thou belongest? Like, who's your master? And whence art thou? And he said, I am a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite. Now, Amalekites, according to Genesis 36, the descendants of Esau. It says, and my master left me because three days are gone and then I got sick. So he left him, <laughs> left him stranded. Are uh, you sick? Ah, oh, no, nah, I can't do nothing with you. Bye. <laughs> but anyway, it says, we made an invasion upon the south to the uh, Chesrathites and upon the coast, which belonged to Judah and upon the south of Caleb. And we burned Ziglag with fire. So now they know, okay, you was the one that was, of course, amongst them. So look at this, verse 15. And David said to them, can you bring me down to his company? Can you go show me where they all at? And he says, swear to me by God that thou will neither kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master. And I will bring thee down to this company. I'll show you exactly where they at. So it says right here, it says, um, here we go. And when David had brought him down, behold, it was spread abroad upon all the earth, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil that they had taken out of the land of the Philistines and out of the, hand, out of the land of Judah. And David smote them from the twilight evening, sheesh, until the evening of the next day, right? Twilight of the evening is when it's getting dark. And then it said until the evening of the next day, sheesh. And there escaped not a man of them, save 400 young men, which rode upon camels and got up out of the fled. And David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. And David rescued who? His two wives. Man, you think there would be more important things to be worried about. He went back at them women. Why'd you go and rescue them? There you already had another wife, me, Carl. Jeez, you at war. Surely you got other things to be worried about <laughs> and it says that there was none there was nothing lacking to them neither small nor great neither sons nor daughters neither spoil nor anything that they had taken to them david recovered all he recovered everything mm. let's go to second samuel real quick chapter three now here we go so both of you all are getting there. All right. So 2 Samuel chapter 3, it says, now there was what? What that say, sis? Long war. Look at that. I go that war between the house of Saul and the house of David. But David waxed stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul waxed weaker and weaker. And unto David were what? Sons born in Hebron. Look at this, a whole nother city, right? And his firstborn was Amnon firstborn of who a Hinnom the Jezreelites of the Jezreelites remember who was a Hinnom that was Abigail's friend one of the damsels one of the one of the five damsels that went with her in first Samuel 25 right remember if you've been paying attention in first Samuel 25 when we had learned um right 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 here and David also took a Hinnom of Jezreel look at that and also both of them was the wives See that? Remember we had learned about that Saul uh, giving me call the daughter. We already read in 2 Samuel 3. This is the same chapter. We had read that earlier. He had got her back. Right? He went and got her back. But look, let's go back. So it says, um, here it is, a long war between them, right? But look at this. Look at what he's doing. Still collecting wives. 
during this long war. Because remember, we got this post of the sister saying there was a whole war going on and y'all still out here trying to collect five more wives. Hey, look at that. And you living in a duplex apartment with the four you have, David, he wasn't even that blessed. He, he wasn't even blessed to even have a duplex or an apartment. He was at a long war, but he was still out collecting wives. And brothers, don't worry. I'm going to show you a solution if you are living in a duplex or an apartment. What can you do, brothers? So that's going to be coming. All right? But anyway, man, I'm tired of living in a duplex and apartment. I do want something nice. All right, bro, look, check it. Keep on paying attention, listen, and learn something. All right. But anyway, so it says here, it says unto David was sons, plural, born in Hebron. Now remember, there's a long war between them and he having babies. You think he have more important things to be worried about, though, right? It says, and his firstborn son was Amnon of Ahinon, the Jezreelist, and the second, Kiliab of Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite, and third, Absalom, the son of Maaka, the daughter of Talmi, king of Geshur. Look at this. Look at another one. The fourth, Adonijah. Now, wait a minute. Hold up. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait a minute. Hold up. Wait a minute. So we got Ahinam, right? Yeah. Then we got Abigail. Yeah. See that? Then we got Maaka. Yeah. See that? And the fourth, Adonijah, hold on. Um, yeah, uh, Adonijah, the son of Hagith, my bad. Here we go. And then it said in the fifth, um, uh, oh yeah, uh, what does it say? Uh, Shef, Shef, uh, what does that say? Shephatia, the son of Abatar. What are these names? Jeez. So right there, then it says, and the sixth, Ithram by Egla, David's wife. Look at this. So right here, it said these were born to David and Hebron. Let me put it out like that as well. Boom. So we got one wife, two wife, three wife, four, five, six. And David is, was in a long war. That's six wives. Now the sister right here say there's a whole war going on and y'all still out here trying to collect five more wives. Man. But David himself didn't have none of that. But he was in a long war. Mm. And we still going to be dealing with this whole war thing too. I'm not even done with that. But I just want to use David's example because David had less. David didn't have this. They was on the runs, two of his wives were taken in slavery, captive, if you will. Man, but look at that. That's one wife, two wife, three wife, four wife, five wife, six wife. Then he went back and got his other wife. Remember, and David sent messages to Ishbosheth, Saul's son, saying, deliver me my wife, me call. You think he had more important things to worry about since he had war. In a long war, you think he got more important things to be collecting wives. Surely he got other things to be worried about. You having kids and all of that, David, you ain't got nothing else better to do? Huh? But sisters is significantly or subliminally upset at brothers because they doing that? Hell. But right here is he, you would think that he having six women like, yo, bro. All right, you got enough. He wanted to go back and get a woman who he could have just kept it pushing, honestly, because at that point, she was with Fauci. Saul gave her away. But no, I want that one too. Deliver me my wife, we call a me call, which I expose to me for 100 foreskin of the Philistines. Look at the word expose. So he read Aras, I believe. Aras. Well, we had our delivery, man. There we go, spouse. Aras, yeah, aras to engage for matrimony, betrothed, expouse. Look at that. Aras is the word. So 
And again, it said that Israel says, sent and took her from her husband, even from foul to the son of Laish. And her husband with her, um, went with her along behind her, um, weeping behind her. So obviously he was crying out, no, my wife, no. And he told him, hey, get up out of here, go return. And he got up out of there. You know, everybody knew how David got down anyway. You know what I'm saying? He knew how he got down. Like, yo, hey, you probably don't want this smoke, bro. You need to go ahead and get on the pot of that. Like, and he the one who killed all these Philistines. For real. So remember, ladies and gents, those who are watching, even sis, I know you're going to see this. Remember you said there was a whole war going on. Hmm? Remember, she wasn't talking spiritual war. She talking physical. The first question is that I have, like even we're moving on, is is the nation of Israel at a physical war with anyone? No, physical war. Huh? Also, if you say yes, yeah, they are. Okay, well then, so let's put ourselves in our shoes then. If you say yes, then what's the law that uh, that the nation of Israel had to follow if they went to war against their enemies? Huh? What was the law on that? What was the law on that? If you say, yeah, well, we are at war. Okay, well, look, let's go look at the law on that real quick. Let's see if they had anything they'd be worried about. Deuteronomy 21, verse 10. Here we go. Female carrying away captives. It says, when thou goest forth to war against your enemies. See, so understand that Deuteronomy 21, because even for the anti-poly people in the community, you have verse 1 through 9, which is dealing with atonement for unsolved murders. Then you have 10 through 14, which deals with marrying female captives. Then you have 15 through 17, which deals with inheritance being passed down for man only had two wives. Then you have uh, 18 through 21, which is dealing with a rebellious son. Then, of course, you have 21 to 23, of course, the judgment, you know what I'm saying, that Christ redeemed us from, according to Galatians 3 and 13. You know what I'm saying? Another topic, though. So, anyway, Deuteronomy 21 and 10. Do 14 is dealing with those specific things. It says, when you go forth to war against your enemies. Now, remember, the sister said, whole war going on. This is talking about a physical war right here then. So it says, and the Lord your God have delivered them into your hands, and you have taken them captives. And you see us among the captives, a beautiful woman. Look at this. A beautiful woman. Look at that. Let me highlight that real quick. And has a desire unto her. Oh, look at that. Desire. We has a desire unto her. It says that thou shouldest, what? That thou wouldest have as her to thy wife. Now you would think that the brother would have something much more important to be worried about, seeing the fact that it's wartime, if you will. So it says, then shall thou bring her home to your house. And she shall save her head and par her nails, right? Trim her nails. And she shall put the raiment of her captivity off from her and shall remain in your house and be well her father and her mother a full month. And after that, you shall go in unto her and be her husband and she shall be your wife. Look at that. So understand that we got the law on war, right? If he went to war against his enemies, remember back in verse 10, right? Back in verse 10, it let us know right there. If you went, uh, when you go as forth against the war against your enemies, right? Going against the war against your enemies. And he saw among them, those we took down, a beautiful woman. Beautiful woman. And that's something. And what he had to do. She had to shave her head and had to par her nails, meaning what? She had to trim her nails. And she had to mourn over her parents a full month, 30 days. And it said after that, she was able to go on, he was able to go into her and be the wife. And uh, she was going to be his wife. And that was going to be her husband. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? Wow. Isn't that something? So, wanted you to understand that. 
Why don't you understand that? Now get this, there's more. So also if one was a warrior, right? What was the law behind him if he took a wife? If he took a wife, was he fit to be in the war? Now remember, ladies and gents, look, let me go back. So remember, she says there's a whole war going on and y'all still out here trying to collect five more wives. Again, according to her, she's not saying it's bad. She's not saying that it is against the Bible, right? But she did make her stance clear on what she really feel. You get what I'm saying? Because, you know, sometimes people say that, well, I ain't saying it's against the Bible in a sense of just in case if it's not, you know what I'm saying? Then I fall on the side of, hey, well, I ain't saying it was against the Bible. You know, I'm neutral. You know, she didn't really make her stance really full on what it is that she believed in because what is implying, what is it implied that it would be wrong. You get what I'm saying? Or it's left open for interpretation. Why? Because you didn't make yourself clear in the actual post. You get what I'm saying? And even if you're not saying that, sis, some people are seeing that. They seeing that and some of them don't know. It's bad enough that about 98% of the sisters in this community, ah, uh, yeah, that's a whole nother topic. I did two videos on Israelite sisters worth marrying, brothers. Yeah. But anyway, so um, here we go. So the question is, if remember, since you bring a war, people go to war, well, who warriors? If a person was a warrior, went to war, were they even fit to even be in the war? That's a question. What is there a law on that? Let's see about that. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 24. Deuteronomy 24. All right. Look at verse five. It says, when a man have taken a new wife, look at that, a new wife. She's new wife. That's the key word right there. All right. Not a wife, a new wife. It says, he should not go out to war right there. So look, sis, you said there's a whole war going on. Well, according to our law, if a man took a new wife, the command was he shouldn't even go out to war. So just by what you're saying right here, when you said there's a whole war going on and y'all still out here trying to collect more wives, well, we got a law on that. If a man took a new wife, he shouldn't even be going out to war anyway. So guess what, sis? He don't even qualify to be in a war anyway if we want to say it's a physical war. So if it was a physical war against Israel and people had to go out and defend themselves and stuff like that, he couldn't do it. Why? Because he took a new wife. Couldn't do it. He couldn't even do it. See that? We read about when you take someone captives and you went to war against the enemies. Now we read if he took a new wife, he couldn't even do it. So, so guess what? A poly man, this, that comment don't even apply to him. It don't even apply to him anyway. But let's go ahead and get back to it. it says, when a man have taken a new wife, he shall not go out to war. Neither shall he be charged with any business. Look at that. But he shall be what? Free at home one year and shall cheer up his wife, meaning make her happy, which he had taken. Look at this real quick. Let's see what the good one. Let me see what that say. When a man is newly married, it says he is not to be drafted in to military service or any public duty. It says he is to be what? Excused from duty for one year so that he can stay at home and make his wife happy. You know what I'm saying? So only thing I, um, I didn't agree with is that newly married. That's not even any Hebrew text. Let me see something real quick. Sefera uh, Devlarim 24.5. Ki Yisach Ish Ishar. I'm sorry. Ki Yisach Ish Isha Harasha. Lo Yize Bazava. Lo. Um, velo. Yeah, Avor. Yeah, it's not even there. Yeah, it didn't say nothing about no newly Harry right there. All right. So here it is. It's letting us know right there when he take him. Uh, uh yeah. Of uh, when a man take a wife, yeah. Uh huh. Boom. Yeah. Harasha right there. New wife. It didn't say newly married there. So in the Hebrew text, they don't say that. Boom. Yeah. Well, look at that. So in the Hebrew text, it didn't say newly married. It's talking about a new wife. Right here, let me highlight that for you. 
Boom. Let's highlight that. That's what it says in the text. Matter of fact, let me show you something real quick. Hold on one second. All righty. Here we go. Oh, wait, I ain't show the screen. My bad. Show the screen. Where you at? Boom. All right. So I copied and paste. Um, matter of fact, look, let me show you real quick. Deuteronomy 24. All right, Deuteronomy 24 and verse 5. Here's what I show you. Key, yeah, Yechach Ish, the man, here we go, Yesha, Chalasha, right here, boom. Copy and paste that. So it's letting us know here. Um, key, Yecha, so when he have taken Ish, letting us know, or uh, when a man have taken Isha, which is the wife, uh, which is the word for new, Lo, Yeze, he should not go out. Then we have the word um, bazava to war. All right. So here is the words that I'm looking at right here. Isha, Kharasha. Let's click on that. Boom. A new woman. A new, new woman. Or Isha, which means wife. You mean woman or wife. All right. Isha. All right, Isha. All right. Now, with that being said, let's go back. Sefer Devarim. All righty. Sefer Devarim. All right. Boom. So, right there, sis, when you made that comment, guess what? If you if you were to say that they are at war, then guess what, sis? According to this right here, if he's collecting five more wives, and that would mean that he 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 can't even fit he can't even go to war for five years because he should be home making her happy at that point. Didn't say he couldn't go take more, but he said he should be home making her happy at that point. So what I'm saying is that your logic, like based on your logic, you know, whether you meant this literal, figuratively, it don't even it don't even apply to that man. It don't even apply to him. So again. If he's at war and get married, he's not fit to even be at war according to our law. So sisters should tell him, if you want to have an input, don't go to war for a year. <laughs> That's what you should say. That's the only thing you could say. Don't go to war. Don't be at war. You can't, you can't even go to war. This would mean when you, uh, when you said, y'all still out here trying to collect five more wives, this means you should say, you should have said uh, you can't go to war for five years. Now, let's address the duplex apartment. So remember what you said, there's a whole war going on. And y'all still here trying to collect five more wives. And you're living in a duplex an apartment with the four you have. Law, the things you see in Israel, shaking my head. Two chops to the throat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't come for me. <laughs> so, uh, ladies and gents. What I will say is um, we're going to address this. Now, this is easy work. Now, I first want to point out the fact that David had wives and children and was homeless, and yet the Most High didn't have anything to say about it. Meanwhile, he's homeless on the run, and of course, first Samuel 25th chapter, he couldn't even feed himself, but was still get married. Now, brothers, if... This is why you have to be, I mean, this is why you have to be careful on who you allow your, your wife or wives to be around. Because believe me, if not, this falls on the line between the unwritten rules of polygyny number seven. And if you don't have a book, then you don't know about the war. I ain't going to even mention it, but I will say this, this, uh, this book is relevant to this post too. To show you brothers how to deal with that and even show you sisters how to deal with it too because it's for women too if you have not gotten a book you have no idea what i'm speaking about those who got my book know what i'm talking about 
Now, I will say this before I address the comment that she said. So we can look at the biblical side and then we can look at the physical side as well. So one, I'm going to look at um, uh, Ecclesiasticus, also known as, no, no, matter of fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to uh, First Timothy. First Timothy, nope. Yeah, yeah, First Timothy chapter six and verse six to eight. Is it six to eight? Yeah. It says, but God in this with contentment, like being content is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world and it's certainly or for surely we can carry none now. And having a food and raiment, food and raiment, let us be content. Like be content with what you got. Be content with what you have. Let's look at the book of Ecclesiasticus real quick before I say what I want to say on this stuff, on the apartment and the duplex, if you will. Sirach chapter 11, verse 21, brothers. It says, marvel not at the works of sinners. But sometimes you may see people, they may be doing a lot better than you, but they ain't even keeping God's laws. Don't be surprised. Though. Don't be marveled at their works, but trust in the most high and abide in your labor. For look at this. It is an easy thing, easy thing in the eyes of the sight of the Lord on the what? On a sudden to make a poor man rich. You have no idea what he can do with you overnight. What he can do with you overnight. There's a video I saw of a brother. I, forget, I don't know his name, but I've seen a few of his videos. But he said um, something that um, I wanted to address. And then my wife was actually talking about it the other day. Um, but anyway, he said, um, now somebody asked him a question. Uh, should you be pursuing uh, marriage if you broke? And the brother said, um, well, it all depends. And he was like, there are three types of the three types of um, basically the three things you can have that will basically determine that basically he'll bring up before I answer the question if the person is broke or not. All right, because typically speaking, some people will look at you being broke as uh, you don't have monetary things. You know what I'm saying? So one of the things was said was, um, what do you say? Um, you got finance, cash. Then he said credit. Then he said trade. That's what he said. So he said, well, if you're the type of person that uh, has cash, then I'm just kind of paraphrasing. You know what I'm saying? And obviously, you know, you can help your family, support your family, if you will. But if you're the type of person that don't have that, then you need to be able to have some good credit. So therefore, if you don't got cash, then you can say, hey, I can bring credit to the table. So it's like, yo, I can go get us a loan and then I can go um, and get a down payment on the house, if you will. Therefore, so she, he won't be living in a duplex and things like that you know what i'm saying it can be a process you know what i'm saying just like a lot of us have had processes even myself so at that point he can go and get a car he can go get more than one car he can matter of fact which will go to the third thing of course um and that's something i'll be touching based on uh in the future about the financial aspect too for brothers but um i'm gonna kind of keep it short and simple when you those who are propolybook.com got a subscription they're going to be the ones who have access to a lot of uh, exclusive things, but definitely get the book propolybook.com. Anyway, one thing he said was a trade. Now, obviously, you know, sometimes when you think of trade, you think of, you know what I'm saying? Um, well, he did say HVAC and things like that, or like plumbing and things like that, which is good as well. But he also said, uh, and I'm just paraphrasing, uh, something that where you can take, um, you can take something and get a stream of income from. So therefore, when you bring it to your household, your wife can help turn that vision into something like bigger. Some of you were saying like that, you know what I'm saying? So that would be like such as like writing a book, if you will. Uh, hold on one second. Let me grab this right quick. Um, writing a book. Then he also said this too. Let me grab it. Hold on one second, guys. Okay. One of the things he did mention was i'm back videography you know what i'm saying you can make a lot of money with this guys you know what i'm saying videography you can create strings of income getting the camera like hey it ain't cheap doing this but you can start a business with this as i've done you know what i'm saying another thing hold on one second um give me a second guys hold up here okay coming back so here we go sorry about that guys okay 
All right, another stream of income. Boom. So you can do the videography. You know what I'm saying? Another thing you can do. Boom. You know how much money you can make with this? This is a drone. Like you can uh, do uh, real estate and things like that and uh, record properties. You get the certifications. You know how much they'll pay you. You know what I'm saying? So there are things that you can do and businesses that you can start, brothers, so that you can do this. And um, so he was saying that if you got these things, guess what? Then he was basically saying, no, you ain't broke, if you will. So there are things that you actually can do, brothers. You know what I'm saying? So um, now going into the type of business, it ain't cheap. You know what I'm saying? So, but it can be done. It can be reached. You know what I'm saying? And you can get you and your wife or wives out of that duplex or out of that apartment if that's something y'all don't desire. You know what I'm saying? Everybody's different. Some people, everybody don't desire a house. Everybody don't desire that. You know what I'm saying? But if somebody does, then guess what? All right, you know, hey, if you want more, there's nothing wrong with that. You know what I'm saying? You can create streams of income. You know what I'm saying? That's what he meant by trade. You know what I'm saying? Um, getting something that can turn more money and turn something into more money. You know, I'd be out, people be like, yo, man, I'm joining um, 13s? Nah, bro, these the poly 13s, boy. <laughs> man, let me, what's your number? Let me get that. You know what I'm saying? Boom. So, real quick, hold on. Real quick, let me show you something as well, brothers, because it's something I want to share with you all. So, it's a photo album right here. You know, just some people, you know, who got the book. The book's going all over the world. You know, just some of the products and whatnot. But look, hold on. Look at this. Well, uh, the book is in Africa, stuff like that. You know, people's getting all over the world. Boom. Look at this. Hold on. In Africa. Do you see that? In Africa. Stuff going all over the world. Caribbean islands. You know what I'm saying? Going all over the world. All over the world. That would be the sense of trade if you will, turning something and getting an income out of it. You get what I'm saying? So believe it or not, if you are living in a duplex or an apartment and, uh, you know, to so your brothers and, and you got no goals or a plan to get you out of it, you don't know where to turn or exactly what you need to do so that you can have the things that these worldly Israelites be complaining about, guess what, bro? I got a solution. Reach out to me so that we can help you, help you get your credit fixed. And I mean fixed fast. I ain't talking no uh, long periods of time, you know what I'm saying? But you got to be willing to invest in yourself. You see, if you sitting there, you know what I'm saying, your credit score is trash, you know what I'm saying? Then yes, you're going to be stuck in that apartment. You're going to be stuck in that duplex. You know what I'm saying? You're going to be stuck there. And then you're going to hear her worldly ass complain. But guess what? Now, now think about something. For the most part, if you are, uh, how can I put this? You see, if, if the woman is a, uh, a single mom and things like that, no one complains about her having all these babies and can't afford them and needing government assistance. No one says nothing. But if the brother is struggling, oh, everybody's down his throat. But anyway, guess what, bro? It's a solution for that. If you get that 750 credit score, at least 750, then at that point, you can get it, you know what I'm saying, whatever house you desire. Get you a good home or auto loan. You can do more at that point if that's something you desire. You know what I'm saying? So if you if you can do the same, yeah, and I say, and you can do the same with your wife. Get their credit fixed. And at that point, everybody can do more. In that year that you that you can't go to war, <laughs> since you got to stay home, make your wife happy. If you if you at war. 
<laughs> you see what I'm doing is I'm, elim I'm eliminating any excuse a lot of these rebellious Israelite sisters are saying. Not saying that she is, but I'm just saying in general. Because somebody would take that post and run with it. You see what I'm saying? So, and these simp Israelite men who be trying to impress them, they do the same thing too. All the excuses going to get shut down one by one. And that's what I'm going to be doing mainly on this channel, though. But the thing about it is I do put a challenge out to the sister that did make this post. Somebody sent it to her. It's the challenge. The brothers who you talking about. Do me a favor. Let me, uh, do me a favor. Send them this way. Ask them their credit score. And if it's under 750, send them my way. Whether you got student loans uh, on their um, child support, whether you got bankruptcy, uh, man, you name it, they do charge or all of it, anything that's on your credit report, you want to wipe clean. You know what I'm saying, brothers? You want that fresh start. You want to start over. You know what I'm saying? You want to learn how to turn credit into money so that you don't have to do a nine to five. You don't have to do that. And you can still get your job. I mean, your, uh, well, yeah, your business. Um, um, turning uh, credit into money, you know what I'm saying? To where all those worldly things they're complaining about, you'll be able to have that and then you can provide for your family. You get what I'm saying? Those things can happen. But bro, you got to let your pride down. Come holler at me. Come holler at me. You know what I'm saying? But if you ain't got the book, ProPolyBook from ProPolyBook.com, don't come holler at me because it's going to be things we're going to talk about and it's going to be in this book and I'm like, turn to this page and X, Y, and Z. And if you can't turn to that page, nah, no. And if you got more than one wife, everybody needs to have a book or don't come holler at me. Don't waste my time. The stuff she can complain, the stuff she complain about, that's small. That's a lightweight. That's lightweight. You don't have to be in that apartment. You don't have to be in that duplex if y'all don't want to, if y'all don't desire. There's a way out. You ain't got to be rich to have this stuff and make this stuff done. You ain't even got to have no money. You can have good credit. Anybody know the credit game know what I'm talking about. But I got some special things coming, though. You know what I'm saying? I got some things to show y'all. Better than I can tell y'all. But everything is about timing. You get what I'm saying? But, again, propolybook.com. And this book is not just for women and for men who are anti-poly. It's for men and women who are pro-poly. But if you be lying and sneaking and you be beating on your women, you probably don't want to get this book because I'm going to get on your ass, bro. You know what I'm saying? You got to treat these sisters right. For real. We got to hold ourselves accountable as men. You know what I'm saying? So I made a lot of mistakes in my past, but that's called growth. It's growth. You know what I'm saying? It's growth. You know what I'm saying? So what I am saying is the thing that, that the sisters complaining about, man, we could shut all that down. Shut all that down. And that's going to really separate, like, okay, now you're just making an excuse. You were complaining about him not having a car, but look, guess what he done did, girl? He can get credit and everything. He didn't got you and him a car, you know what I'm saying, or whatever it is you desire, business credit and whatever. That can happen. That can happen. You know what I'm saying? So uh, some brothers I know, y'all probably don't want to do a nine to five. Okay, cool, bro. Look, we can show you how to, you know, hey, come holler at me. Come holler at me. And I got a lot more things I'm going to be bringing out. Now, check it. So this part right here, because I also said at the bottom right here, and also a new video responds to this comment and meme. So it looks like I'm going to have to do a part two uh, after this. I'm going to end this one, and then I'm going to do a part two and address that as well. You know what I'm saying? So look, propolybook.com. I need you who the yoram I'm the shooter. Look, that this this video was not personal to that specific sister or any specific sister, but there's a lot of misinformation that's being spread around a community. You know what I'm saying? So I could have easily been one of the super brewers, but like, oh, you rebellious woman and you dumb ass, why blah blah. I wasn't gonna do all of that and correct you in love. You know what I'm saying? And if you uh want to reach out, reach out. You most definitely can reach out, but best believe I'm going to ask some questions for you. I'm going to have some questions. I'm going to ask some questions. You know what I'm saying? You or anybody, reach on out. 
But if you got the book, ProPolyWood.com, yeah, hey, going that way. You know what I'm saying? Because there's things in the book. I'm going to want you to be like, hey, look at that real quick on page X, Y, and Z. Oh, why ain't it a book? All right, well, we can't really have this conversation then. You know what I'm saying? So, um, yeah. The Unwritten Rules of Polygyny. So you see, we just addressed the first part, right? That's the long story short on that. But as you already see, as I highlighted here, which is my words here, and also a new video responds to this comment and meme. Now, you know, we already got on the word polygamy, you know, in the beginning, of course. The correct term is not polygamy, but polygyny, as you see in the background on my flag, all right? Now, of course, if you got the book, The Unwritten Rules of Polygyny, then you already know how that's incorrect, of course. Now, so this person here put polygamy, says it's used as a noun, but says the ability to disappoint several women at once. The ability to disappoint several women at once. The ability to disappoint several women at once. Keyword, ability. Ability, which is what? Basically from this context, it is the skill or the potential to disappoint several women at once. I'm gonna repeat that. It is the skill or the potential, potential to disappoint several women at once. Well, even though I'm anti-polygamy, as you already know that, but I'm also pro-polygyny, and the word polygyny being the key word. Now, look, in any marriage, one has the ability or the potential to disappoint. In any marriage, it doesn't matter if, if we're talking monogamy or polygyny, if we're talking uh, two people who's getting to know each other. In any type of dynamic, one has the potential or the skill or the ability to disappoint several women, or the woman has the potential to disappoint her husband, such as her being stubborn and rebellious, her being wicked. She has the potential to do that, right? Of course. But anyway, look, it's the same with monogamy or polygyny. However, in my book, it talks about these very things, though, and how to avoid common mistakes that men make in this lifestyle, in culture, and how to avoid situations that would lead to the, to, uh, the destruction of a home. Now, in Polly, there's a question I have. In Polly, does the man have the ability or the potential to disappoint more than one woman? Yes, of course, of course, I agree with that. In fact, in my book, I talk about not robbing the woman of her choice. I teach men to follow four steps, such as being upfront, being transparent, being unapologetic, and being honest. If you got the book, you know. I talk about being strong enough to hold your house hold in place and building from the first wife. I talk, I talk how the wives should be treated and how to avoid things like neglecting and speaking on things such as nurturing your wives and teaching them and helping them to grow. I talk about those things. I literally talk about these things. In fact, I even teach about um, not being bitter towards your wives and teaching them how to know and understand if the woman you're choosing just ain't fit for your poly dynamics. I teach different dynamics of poly, such as kitchen table poly, parallel, but there's different forms of poly dynamics that most brothers don't know. I teach against domestic violence and sneaking around and how families could make this work as a single unit. This book ain't just for people who are pro-poly, but it's for people who also is against poly. You hear me say that often. 
it clears up a lot of the misinformation spread on poly and how it also sheds lights on poly examples and good poly unions. Look, even in my book, as I say, polygyny is not for everybody. It's not. But monogamy isn't either. Now, does a man have the ability to disappoint several men, uh, women at once? Yes, absolutely. If you buy my book, if you buy the book from propolybook.com, it will help you. It will help him from being a disappointment to several women at once. Yes, absolutely, it will. Now, before we even go dive deep into this, understand in the Bible it has what you and I would call, and let me uh put it up, call it the fruits of the spirit. In the book of Galatians, real quick. Galatians chapter 5 and 22. Galatians chapter 5 and 22. So the Bible teaches what we call the fruits of the spirit, which says what in verse 22. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, which is self-control. Again, such there is no law. I Meaning there's no law against that. Now, the question I ask sisters often is, and this would be to you, sis. And anybody who shared this, agree with it, liked it. If women and men who display these fruits of the spirit at all times, these so-called Bible believers, even if you ain't a Bible believer, even if you one who don't believe in what we call the New Testament today, if, you expl- if, if you're the type of person that display love, joy, peace, long suffering, I'm going to say that again long suffering gentleness not bitterness but gentleness goodness faith meekness being meek temperance having some self control discipline about yourself if each individual understands the commandment as what it says here and let me grab it up real quick in the book of leviticus chapter 19 verse 18 Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge. Don't be holding a grudge. Don't avenge against the children of your people. But right here, but you shall love your neighbors yourself. I'm the Lord. So if each individual understands this and follows this, whether we're talking man, woman, right? If wives understand scriptures like this, let me grab it real quick. And yeah, I know I've done lessons on all these so far. Here, why submit yourselves unto your own husbands, ask them to the Lord, like just as you would submit to the Lord, you submit to your husband. Submit. What does it say? To subordinate, reflectively to obey. See that? Submit to one's control, yield to one's admonition and advice. So what I'm asking is if uh, why is understand um, the concept of why some of you said to your husband, ask him to the Lord? Well, if husbands understood this, well, we had uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse 19. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Yeah. Wouldn't they be better off? Wouldn't it be? a less chance of several women being disappointed? Huh? Think about it. If they just follow just those few principles, when it says the ability to disappoint several women at once, if both parties display that, would that minimize that? Would it minimize that? What are the chances of anyone having an ability to be a disappointment if they strongly follow that wholeheartedly is it less likely and is it possible like is it possible to do to keep the fruits of the spirit and remember to love your neighbors yourself why submit yourself to your husbands is it possible to do that for bible believers today 
Is it possible? And if it's possible, then at that point, wouldn't it be a lot less likely? And if it is possible, what does all parties have to do to reach this goal? This can be accomplished in three easy steps, brothers and sisters, if you're listening. But number one, you have to be serious. You have to want this at all costs. And, on, and no matter what, you have, to, you have to be able to want to do this with your whole heart. You have to be able to want to do this. This can be an easy fix, what is being said there. Because again, even though I don't agree with polygamy, and I agree with polygyny, which is the difference. I do agree with that concept though, because it's in my book, I talk about it. But three easy steps. Number one, understanding the unwritten rules of polygyny. Believe it or not, there are some things that is not written down that would help you understand and help you have peace in your own. And it would, it would be things that also help you Understand that you might have been wrong about some things that you thought you knew about poly as well. You know what I'm saying? There are people that failed at it and gave up on it. And there are people that were successful with it. You know what I'm saying? Decide, I don't know if I want to do this. Polygyny ain't for everybody, but monogamy isn't either. You know what I'm saying? I've made mistakes in poly. I've made mistakes in monogamy, which was never, because I was never really monogamous, but anyway. But understand the unwritten rules of polygyny is the first thing. The second thing, Buying the book from propolybook.com. What book? The Unwritten Rules of Polygyny. Buy that book, brothers and sisters. Make sure if you got a couple, both of y'all get the book and read at the same time. Read on your own time. Come back and, and go over in examples of chapters. This is why I learned this chapter. So I learned that chapter. You know, what are some things you think we need to work on from this chapter? What are some things that we can do better from this chapter, better understand? How can we progress forward? Than what we learned from this chapter. Why? Because that brings me to number three, which is the most important one. Applying what you are reading. Application. One thing to have the knowledge of it, but it's better to also have the application as well. This is key for brothers, not having this ability or the potential to becoming um, a disappointment to several women in polygyny. Not polygamy. I'm not polygamous. But what I want to do is I want to do something special. Though. I want to share some things from the book to show that what I'm saying is, is true. And I, I agree with a lot of what's been said there. One thing I even see right there, according to this picture, if you just notice, you see the four women right there, right? They're not even holding hands at all. They look all sad, if you will. You know what I'm saying? They're not even together. You, you don't even see the unity in that. You know, so to me, pictures say a lot. They're not even holding hands. Look at that. They're not even holding hands. They're not even in unison together. You know what I'm saying? So that's something right there that tells a lot. But anyway, um, in my book, Unwritten Rule Number Four, if y'all think I'm lying, look at this. Chapter four, or unwritten rule number four, not robbing her of her choice. Brothers, y'all got that bad. Y'all robbed a woman of her choice. Put her in situations that she really didn't want to be in. You do that. You know what I'm saying? That'll bring a disappointment to the woman, though. So this is what I say. After reading chapter three, you should understand how polygyny works in America and how to build your house on a rock and not sand. I ended the chapter by speaking on men who rob women of their choice in polygyny. And we will continue the conversation in this chapter. I'm going to warn you, it's about to get ugly in here. If your house is built upon sand, I encourage you not to let your spouse or potential wife read this chapter because it will expose a lot. Now look, brothers, your household ain't together. If you are being a disappointment to these poor women, I want to keep it from this chapter and so far because it's gonna go down bro but i said if you're reading this this uh, if you're reading this sentence this means you didn't take heed to what i said 
So I read this at your own risk. Like, look, bro, you decide to let y'all keep reading. All right. So I said, brothers, remember, I'm speaking as a man. But I'm also speaking as an experienced man. Because as you know, I have more than one wife. All right. Um, anyway, so I said, um, I'm speaking as a spirit man who is experienced man who is successful in polygamy right here in America. And I have a strong house built upon a rock. I said, I'm also speaking as a man who has made mistakes. Yes, I have. But have learned from them and by watching learned behavior of some of the brothers in our community. Just like what the sister saying in that mean. So I said, remember Proverbs 1 and 5 says, a wise man will hear, he gonna listen, and will increase learning. And a, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsel. This means, this means a wise man will listen, learn more. And that man who is, of, who, is, who is of understanding will receive guidance. With that, we know and understand a woman is to submit to us in everything as the Bible says. We know and understand that they are to do what the Bible says. But remember, this book is called The Unwritten Rules of Polygyny. So again, y'all, this is going to things that are not written. I said, this is for the sake of you getting and restoring peace into your home and getting it off that sand that is built on because it will fall. And if you keep it out there out of pride, the following are more unwritten rules so that I'm um, said so that uh, are also are not in the Bible, like these following unwritten rules, but will help you in building your household. Number one, be upfront, be transparent, be unapologetic, and be honest. I remember oh, that's what I got right there. Hold on, wait one second. Boom. See those rules right there? One through four? Yeah, you see it. I see it. Well, most of you brothers go wrong is not being upfront, not being transparent, and having the nerve to be unapologetic when you're not completely honest about what you're doing. Although it is your God-given right to take on another wife without her permission. But in doing so, without being honest and upfront about it, you are destroying her peace and yours. When you do that, you are then building your house up on sand and not a rock. It's not solid. Now, I don't want to read too much, but what I will say is this. I know some of you brothers may not wish to hear this because it's something I skipped. I went in, but I'm reading after that. As I know some of you brothers may not wish to hear this, but hiding uh, and pretending as if you don't want to be a part of polygyny, when you know damn well you do, is bogus. You will constantly lie, sneak around, and you will constantly get caught and then lie after getting caught. Brothers, once the peace in your home is uh, has diminished, this is when it becomes a problem. This is when the house you built on a rock is now built on sand. Now, most men say things like, yeah, I'm polygynous. I'm the man of my household. I'm in charge. Then when his wife comes around, he doesn't have, no, nah, I ain't going, you're going to have to get the book to read that. But I'm going to read some of this on another page, though. Uh, let's see, what do I want to share with you all? The house will fall, no fall hard and fast. No, I'm not going to read that part. You have to read, get the book to get that. All right, here's one right here. I said, there was another unwritten rule that I like to speak on now. Brothers, as a believer of the Bible, you can tell her to submit to you. Woman, submit! Right? But in the beginning, there was nothing established there. All right? There was no foundation laid. There was no bond or trust built. My question to you, brothers, is what does it matter to her if she doesn't fully understand her role as a woman who is a believer of the Bible? You can easily say, hey, woman, submit. Meanwhile, you're not the one she wants to submit to. How do you get past this part? Hmm. Do you get respect and throw in the towel right away? I'm sorry, do you get upset and throw in the towel right away? Remember. She doesn't know her divine role, or so I say understand her divine role that the Most High set out for her. Well, here is the rude awakening, brothers. 
sometimes women won't submit to you. It's not because they are wicked and don't want to, but because she see you as a house that was built upon sand and not a rock. And when you read my book, you will get to uh, seeing what I'm talking about, what I meant by that. But anyway, I said, uh, there, uh, this can be because of your mental state. Some brothers, hey, some of us, brothers, you ain't mentally stable to take on this, bro. Sometimes you might be biting no more than what you can chew. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. That's what I'm saying. Uh, that's what I'm saying. Like, uh, let me go here. Wow, it can be the ability to disappoint several women at once. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, absolutely. But anyway, um, where we at? Yeah, this could be because of your mental state and how you are conducting yourself in your polygynous lifestyle. So it's kind of like, you know, like take for instance, me and my household. We don't do threesomes, orgies, or group sex or nothing like that. We're not into that. But brothers, if you're coming off like that's what you want, that's what you want to do, then yeah, bro, you're building your house up on sand, my dude. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, yo, uh, negative, I'm up out of here. Woman, you supposed to submit and blah, blah, blah. Uh, hey. hey, it's your household, though. You know, can't you tell you what's doing your household, hey. Yeah. Anyway, I said, um, this can be because of your mental state and how you are conducting yourself in your polygynous lifestyle. So I said, let's talk about the mentality while in polygyny. You got to have a certain mindset, brothers. If you are always negative, always about drama, this goes between you and your lifestyle, you and uh, your woman and women, and you know just how you live in your life, surrounded by drama, whether it's through them or not. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, I said, always thinking in a depressive state. You know, just that you're just down and blue all the time. I say bitter or want woman hating. Then trust me when I say no woman is going to come your way. If she does, then trust me, brother, this won't last long. I mean, unless she's in a prison. <laughs> if you are trying to pursue a second wife, and she comes into your union and sees that you and your first wife are not doing so well, she will not want to get on board with your polygyny union. So you'd be telling her, woman, you need to submit, and blah, blah, blah. But she see you ain't mentally stable, bro. She see that uh, she can't trust you with her health. You know what I'm saying? She can't uh, uh, get a break. Why? Because the, the first wife is coming down on her or... You know what I'm saying? She's bringing drama to you. You know what I'm saying? Then meanwhile, you telling her to submit, but your first wife being messy and running her off. Who gonna want to come and be a part of that damn circus? Dummy. What is you doing? Then you lying and sneaking and, you know, don't get me wrong. You gotta be spying your every move and all of that. You ain't gotta do all of that. But if you lying to your first wife, yeah, I don't want to be poly, uh, blah, blah, blah. But you're seeing text messages and you're liking some suspicious finding numbers and seeing your flirt and all of that. Bro, she ain't stupid. How long do you think that's going to last? Dumbass. Huh? Come on now. So before you can even be successful with that and before you can break this, this uh, disability or potential to disappoint several women at once, you got to learn the unwritten rules. But anyway, I go on to say, if you're trying to sue a second wife and she comes into your union and sees that you and your first wife are not doing well, she would not want to get on board with your polygyny union, bro. That's just what it is, nigga. She isn't going to submit to you, no matter what you say. The bad energy between you and your first wife can be felt by her. Hmm. The bad energy between you and your first wife can be felt by her. I have to say it again. She sees that your first wife has an attitude about this. And now you telling her, like, this is you telling your second woman. Yeah, baby, <laughs> you know, my first wife is okay with polygyny. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? She cool with it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm Polly. She cool with it. It's all good. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? My first wife is okay with polygyny. Soon after bringing her around for the first time, the first wife says, this is not okay. Why did you bring her here? 
I don't like this. Or, you know, she may give those hints and then she can feel that bad energy, nonchalant and, you know, got an attitude. What I'm saying here is, I say um, the second wife, or we could say potential wife, more than likely is it going to see herself in your household because she saw the smoke coming from afar. And we all know where there's smoke, there is a fire. And I got in parentheses, chaos. This is why it's important to bring nurturing along with strength and protection to your home. The subject of nurturing is really, is, is really is up for discussion because people usually tend to associate nurturing to women. As if men can't be nurturing as well. Brothers, this is very important. Nurture your wives and, cl and clear any smoke between you. Listen, brothers, clear any smoke between you two before bringing a potential second wife into your home. So if y'all got some issues in your home, bro, it's good to establish that foundation with your first wife, which I talk about later in the book. It's good to do it. And this book ain't one to skip, though, either. You can't just skim through. But if there's some smoke or chaos between you and your first wife, it's good to set the tone, to bring that peace into your home, restore that peace. Why? So that you can bring the second woman into a peaceful home, a good environment, not a toxic one. You know what I'm saying? So it's bad enough that some of our sisters have trauma, even our men. I did a video called oh, Israelite Brothers Worth Marrying, just like I did two videos called Israelite Sisters Worth Marrying. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. But anyway, I said, um, make sure you are bringing her into a peaceful environment. Another good unwritten rule is make sure you can see this woman fitting into the dynamics of your lives. And if her personality can match with yours, they don't have to match with your wives, but as long as they match with yours. And you will learn why, mostly why I'm saying it in the book. It's part one, all right? But it's definitely good with that. You know, all of my wives have different personalities, but they all get along. You see, we got a YouTube channel. You know, not this one, but our YouTube channel. You know what I'm saying? Of course, you buy the book. You get the CD. Where's the YouTube channel at if you don't know? Got it in the book. But then anyway, I said, all of my wives are different in their own ways. Oh, look, I got it right here. I said, yeah, they're able to move as a single unit. For example, like you and a coworker at your job. You all may be from different backgrounds and have different beliefs, but you work together as a team. Polygyny is beautiful, but you have to treat it like a game of spades. Don't just put anyone on your team. Anybody know spades? You know you ain't just put anybody on your team. Even if y'all all agree that the game of spades is fun and the game of spades is cool, I like to play spades, I want to win, you're still not going to put anybody on your team, though, just because y'all got a common uh, belief there of spades but i said um this was a past mistake that i made you know i said i've made mistakes in this i said peace and harmony are great building blocks to create a great dynamic in a polygynous home you should first establish this by having a peaceful state of mind brothers if you always depressed and always down and always negative and all of that bro you ain't gonna have no peace no peace in your mind and you ain't gonna in your mind you're gonna bring that toxic shit in your home and your home going to be toxic. Shit going to trickle down. So anyway, I said, then I said, uh, you should first establish by having, pe by having a peaceful state of mind, then by, uh, by your first wife and anyone else who comes into your union. This ensures a strong house built up on a rock. This is a good unwritten rule to help you for the sake of your peace in the long run. When you have peace, you can have clearer thinking. One thing you can't lose sight of, brothers, is teaching your wife. The breakage of even one unwritten rule could cost you dearly. Man, it's rules. It's just like rules to the streets, rules to the Bible, it's rules to everything. It's rules to everything that you do. There's always a cause and effect. Rules, rules, rules of science. There's unwritten rules as well that ain't written down that you probably would want to know. And if anything, this uh, this seems too hard for you, bro. Probably just ain't for you. Go be monogamous. Go be single. Then it just ain't for you. You know what I'm saying? But anyway, I said if you don't properly, that's key word, properly teaching God your wives, because you always, you know, I teach my wives and mother. If you don't properly, bro, if you don't properly teaching God your wives and properly, not deceivingly, 
not being a lying ass, but properly mold her into a woman of God, fire will come and it will burn your house down. Many brothers fail to understand polygyny, not have knowledge of it. A lot of you brothers don't understand it. Yeah, you got knowledge of it. You see it in the Bible and you, you got knowledge of the culture and things like that, but you don't understand how to move in this lifestyle. This ain't monogamy, bro. This ain't sneaking polygyny. This is open polygyny. A lot of you don't understand it. You know a lot, a lot about it. Your elders may know a lot about it, but they ain't really living a lifestyle being successful with it. Men and them may not have even, you probably don't, you probably don't even know what it's like to, to fail in it. To tell you how to get back up. Yeah, hey, yeah, I did that before, bro. Yeah, I failed that. I chose that woman or I did that. Nah, bro, you might not want to do that. Look, let me tell you what I did in X, Y, and Z. You can decide if you want to do it, but I wouldn't advise that. You know what I'm saying? Trust me, I failed at that. Trust me. But anyway, uh, it says, um, many brothers fail to understand polygyny. One of the reasons is because you don't understand polygyny yourself. Another reason is because you're not affectionate towards your wives. Boy, you wouldn't even believe the times I heard. Ooh, that's another topic. Brothers, there's nothing wrong with being affectionate. I heard a brother tell me one time, man, I don't even figure it to my wife. I don't see that in the Bible. <sighs> what? Anyway, I'm not going to entertain that, but bro, you got a whole lot to learn then, bro. Anyway, I said, for some of you, you get a second wife and you act as if the first wife no longer exists. You just totally just disregard regard her. Neglect. <laughs> don't call, no nothing. You just, just whatever. Then a woman feel like, oh, he replaced me. Come on, bro. Y'all giving Polly a bad name. Stupid ass nigga. Anyway, you begin to neglect the first wife. And she's done nothing to deserve it. Man, now ask yourself. Ask yourself, brothers. Um, What would you do if the shoe was on the other foot? What would you do? How would you feel if... If you were in your wife's position and your husband did uh, uh, did the same to you, or like if Christ did it to you, he neglected you. I don't know you. How would you feel if the Messiah, you know what I'm saying? God straight saying, oh, whatever. Just act like you don't even exist no more. How would that make you feel? Huh? So, or if, if you don't relate to that and you will say, I ain't spiritual, I don't believe in no Bible, how would you feel? You know what I'm saying? Growing up as a kid and your and, and your mom just said, I don't love you, whatever. Just neglect you like you don't exist. How would you feel? Wouldn't feel too good, would it? So I said, so what makes you think that your wife should accept this? Do you think that she's a robot or mechanisms that has no feelings? If you think this type of behavior is acceptable, let's see how long this will last for you, especially if you have not taught her or nourish her with the proper tools that she needs that, uh, that are necessary to help you build a strong house on a rock. What is she going to teach the second wife coming in if she hasn't been taught anything? Nothing, but sis, get ready for the pains and headaches <laughs> and happiness will be non-existent. I know you are still wondering if any of this is in the Bible. No. Can you deny my device? I mean, can you deny my advice, brothers? I say yes. You can be like, I don't want to listen to all that. I said, do you have to agree with what I say? No, you don't, brother. You don't have to agree with what I'm saying. You really don't. I said, I'm just showing you how polygyny can be successful. I know it can be because uh, propolybook.com, the unwritten rules of polygyny. It's not just for brothers who are pro-poly. It's for brothers who are anti-poly. It's not just for sisters who are pro-poly and favor poly. It's for sisters who are anti-poly as well. If you know somebody that be lying, sneaking, and cheating and all of that, you know how I get? Share this book. Share this book. Because believe it or not, a lot of brothers have been coming to me and a lot of brothers have been... Um, they have been on a, uh, you know, on that journey trying to get on the right path and admitting that, dang, man, I've messed up. I've, I broke a lot of unwritten rules. Man, I didn't know this. I didn't know that. Like, man, I'm glad I got the book. Even sisters, 
man, I never knew this about Paula. I thought this was about, Paula was about threes and things like that. I didn't know this. Or when you said this, I never knew that. I saw this on TV and blah, blah, blah. Now you said no, and I didn't know that. You know what I'm saying? I thought in Paula, you had to do this or you couldn't X, Y, and Z. So even if you want to just educate yourself on the lifestyle, you know what I'm saying? And brothers, look, if you're bullshitting and saying, man, I don't know about the book and all of that, bro, look, you can already forget it. You already ain't ready for it. You, you, you're going to fall in the category of this right here, the ability to disappoint several women at once. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? And just because a woman is not agreeing to follow your lifestyle and culture with being poly, guess what, bro? There are sisters I heard it is. This is how it is. Go find them. Go find them. You know what I'm saying? Don't waste your time arguing. All. Go find them. You know what I'm saying? And sometimes women ain't with it. Why? Because they don't understand about it. They got their perception about it. You know what I'm saying? They feel like, oh, I'm going to compete and blah, blah, blah. But my wives handle that on, on, our, on our channel as well. This is the book. That's the flag. These the shoes. <laughs> this the jacket. This the shirt. The cup and many other things. On the back of the book, I say, warning. You're never going to be the same after reading this entire book. Entire, keyword. If you're reading this book, no matter if you're against Polly or in favor of Polly, you're never going to be the same. After reading the entire book, I said, there was something in this book for everyone, and everyone is going to learn untold secrets that is hidden from the public outside of Polly. I want to give you secrets on the pros and, and cons of the lifestyle and culture and reveal inside secrets on Polly and how you can either obtain it in today's time or how you may not be ready for Polly in today's time. So you may read this and be like, dang. I was pro poly at first, and I ain't ready for it. <laughs> Men and women. Propolybook.com. There are things about poly that people don't talk about, and this is where volume one of the book comes in. Before you sign on that poly dotted line, like before you say, yeah, I want to do this, before you sign your life away on this. So I said, um, before you sign on that poly dotted line, read this book. Read it. All right. It's a lot to read, but it's worth it. I said, read this book because I'm going to reveal the unwritten rules or principles to polygyny, even if you don't want to practice poly, even if you don't want to practice it. It's something to learn. You're going to get something out of it. And trust me, brothers, this right here, if you apply this, sisters like this ain't even going to have a room to even say, say stuff like this. She's not going to have a room to even joke like this. She's not going to have a room to do that. she make herself look silly by even doing that. Now, as you see on my channel, youtube.com says Judah the Shooter. I got several videos on the lesson, like one, the Adam and Eve and they two shall be one flesh. Check me out right there with the red poly jacket with the face mask. <laughs> So it says Adam and Eve and they two shall be one flesh. Achad is the uh, name of it or whatnot. Because you know how you get, oh, well, Adam, well, God made Adam and Eve and that was the foundation of marriage. And if he wanted more than one woman, he would have given Adam more than one wife. It says one flesh. Huh? Oh, yeah. Then I got this one. Was Abram's, Abraham's wife, Sarah, really impatient? Because you get that? That saying there. So it's a lot. It's a, a, other topics in that one, too. And you see me with the black poly jacket, the original one. Ha <laughs> ha. Yeah, you already know. Propolybook.com. Polygyny, is it a sin? That's a real good one there, too. You see me right there promoting the merchandise, going in on that, giving several reasons on that. Um, a bishop must have one wife. That's a really good one, too. A good old eye opener, too. Husbands, submit. To your wives, also Ephesians. You know, that's Ephesians 5.21. I go over the context of that. James 4 and 17, the proper context of sin. Or oh, Israelite brothers worth marrying. Ooh, we, you see that? Ooh, we, yeah. Uh, or oh, Israelite sisters worth marrying. This one and this one here. Good one. Proverbs 27, polygyny myth. 
uh, First Timothy five and eight myth. I go over the whole uh, chapter of First Timothy five. Multiple wives in the same house. Uh, can they live in the same house? Is it a sin for them to live in the same house? Do they have to have separate houses? You know, Jacob and his wives had tents. You know, yeah, watch that. Uh, lawful but not expedient. You get people, oh, well, we know polygamy is not unlawful. It's lawful, but it's not expedient. And then they use 1 Corinthians 6. So, yeah, definitely re, uh, watch that. Uh, Exodus 21, uh, polygyny myth. Uh, there's a mystery in this one because it's part two. There's Here go part one right here. But then here go part two. You know, so you really want to watch those back to back. Or well, if you don't, you can actually could just watch. Uh, I don't lie. You could watch part two. You know what I'm saying? And get the gist of it. Um, but yeah, the Exodus 21, 10 and 11. Ooh, we. Romans 13. Follow the laws of the land. Definitely watch that as well. You know what I'm saying? Polygia, that's against the laws of the land. Yeah. And I'm definitely going to be doing a part two on that in the future. But uh, daughters of Zion versus daughters of Satan. Is your wife, is she a daughter of Zion? Is she a daughter of the devil? There's only one way to find out, bro. That'll go your answer right there in that video. Uh, make submission great again. This is me going over the Hebrew New Testament. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5 in Hebrew only. No English. All right. You know what I'm saying? As you can see. Uh, let me turn it on here. See right here? It's me going over reading that. Yeah. So that's what we're going over there. Anyway. Uh, she has no head and she's rebellious. Um, single sisters. Yeah, you might want to watch that. Be a rude awakening. You know what I'm saying? Even I ain't rebellious. Yeah, but you ain't got no hedge. You can go ahead and watch that. Q&A. Uh, breakdown of Ephesians submission. And we also talk about poly too. Uh, concubine versus concubines. I'm going to, what is it? Like, what really is a concubine? And concubines. You get all different type of answers. What is it, really? Uh, First Corinthians 7 and 2. You know, to nevertheless to avoid uh, fornication, let every man have his own wife. They won't have her own husband. What does that really mean in, in, in the mindset that Paul meant when he wrote it in 1 Corinthians 7 and 2? Ooh, we watch that lesson. Rude awakening. Uh, Judah the shoot exposed. This is me um, talking about my shortcomings, mistakes that I made when I was a, being a hypocrite. You know what I'm saying? And I might do a part two on that. You know what I'm saying as well? This is a battle. You know what I'm saying? And it's an uphill battle, but brothers, we got to, we got to overcome it. You know, there's mistakes that we all make as men of the, of the most high. And we can see men of our forefathers made mistakes. You know what I'm saying? But it's what we do with those mistakes. Do we stay in the same mindset or do we correct it? So those are just a few on my poly rants, if you will. But man, this one right here, boy, that Adam and Eve. Uh, woo -wee. Man. It says one flesh or body, if you will. So youtube.com slash Judah the Shooter. You know what I'm saying? Propolybook.com to get the unwritten rules of polygyny. You know, if you if you can prove that you sent about five people to me to actually buy the book, then you can get a choice of a free book or a free jacket. Man, I don't know, man. I can't buy the book. Ain't no excuse. Hey, you gave you, if you, uh, I guess you could say respected by people and you got people that support you. And they'll trust your word and deal with you. You know, surely if you're a decent person, you can find five people, bro. You know what I'm saying? If not, then you might need to reassess your circle or might need to reassess yourself. If people don't even deal with you like that. You know what I'm saying? So there's other things you may be working on. You might be the one that has the ability to disappoint several women at once. You know what I'm saying? So do I agree with the meme? Yes, I agree with it. You know what I'm saying? Uh, polygamy or uh, polygamy <laughs> uh having the ability to uh disappoint several women at once even polygyny but guess what is there a solution to it is the answer to it yes the answer is the unwritten rules of polygyny at propolybook.com that's the solution shalom